Good morning, Margarita. Good morning, Marco. So you you got the prize as a first attendance, non speaking attendance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very impressed. <laughs> Do you expect a lot of attendance? Or there are so many parallel sessions. Yes, indeed. Same time that. Well, actually, it's not true because uh, when in HIEP they have a common room, so we have attendance there. Okay. They simply do not appear as individuals. <laughs> and then, of course, there is the recording, so it will be seen a lot of times. You will get rewarded by YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yes, I saw that. In fact, since I'm invited, you know, <laughs> the plenary, I have access to everything already now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not, as all the, the people that are registered. Right. Hmm. Okay, Fanjun, I think uh, it's time to start. To, to start? Yes, I give you the, the chairmanship. Oh, yeah. So, so we have... I stop sharing. But... Yes. Okay, so dear colleagues, actually, I think most of us are from our consortium. So the first talk of uh, today's meeting is uh, Alessandra De Rosa. So her we'll talk about the uh, overall view of the mission. So please. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, you could see my my slides, I assume. So uh, thanks to organizer. It's a pleasure to be to open this session on the um, EXTP. And uh, well, as you well know, EXTP is a flagship astronomy mission uh, devoted to explore the fundamental physics problems and uh, actually also to serve as a powerful high energy observatory for the worldwide community. Uh, the XTP uh, science case and, uh, and payload are coordinated by uh, ICAS in China and there is a collaboration with the European, in the European um, uh, agency and countries and uh, most of them are uh, listed here. And in Europe, a uh, large part of this mission, large part of the um, instrument of XTP um, are based on the heritage of uh, M3 and M4 study of cosmic vision. I'm talking about uh, Lofte Ishibe. And uh, the mission is currently in phase B1. Uh, the, date, the, the, the date is uh, late 2027. Uh, the minimum mission lifetime is five years with a goal of eight years. Uh, the XCP science objectives uh, will involve the study of extreme physics. That means the understanding the behavior of matter and the extreme condition density, gravity, and magnetism. There are three main science topics XCP will address. The first one is the dense matter. Uh, this means the questionnaire, uh, which is the state of matter at supernuclear density, this means to investigate the interior of neutron stars to investigate the exotic star of matter or the extensive support stars. I suspect that, Mar uh, that um, Anna and Alessandro Dago will talk about this more deeply than me. The second main topic is strong field gravity. That means the property of the space time under extreme condition of gravity. Um, the, the, the study of the accretion flow under strong field gravity regimes. And if there is any deviation from uh, Einstein general relativity theory. And um, I didn't say that the main, the main, uh, of course, the main target of the dense matter are neutron star, uh, thermobus nuclear oscillation, uh, pulsation in, uh, in accreting neutron star, while in the case of strong field gravity, the main target are uh, accreting black holes, both supermassive black holes in AGN and the stellar masses black hole. Again, Anna and Vladimir will talk more about this. And the third core science topic involves strong magnetism. That means the behavior of light in the present ultra strong magnetic field and the prediction of the QAD theory, uh, the, the, the QAD theory. In this case, the target of the, of the observation will be again uh, accreting pulsar, isolated pulsar, transient, and magnetars, of course. And Wafeng will talk more about this. These are the three main core science topics that will be covered by the mission. However, 
XCP will have a key role, also in multi-messenger astrophysics. Uh, so I will show in a minute, so there will be a perfect game as a gravitational wave electromagnetic counterparts. It will perfectly be, uh, work in synergy with neutrino of new TEP emission. And Julia will talk more about this, Julia Strata. Finally, uh, there will be a large part of the science program, I will tell you, dedicated to observatory science. That means some, uh, all kinds of science that, uh, although it, uh, it will not drive the, the, the mission instrument characteristic and constraints, it, do, uh, it will play a, a key role in a plethora of scientific cases that devoted to observatory. And uh, Lee will talk more about this. Uh, of course, if you would like to know more, but uh, I don't think this is the case about our science. There are these science paper devoted to astrophysics and physics the XTP could, could address uh, in this five white paper we published in 2019. So let's go um, quite quickly, uh, quickly in XTP painted concept. This is the image of XTP and uh, with multiple instruments. There are the spectroscopical focusing array that have multiple short focal, um, short focal length modules, nine telescopes here. There are the large area detectors that are uh, 40 collimating modules, the yellow here. There are the polar polarimetry focusing array, four of, the, of these telescopes so with the same op the optics of the SFA and uh, um, three pairs of uh, wide field monitor uh, in this side of the, of, the, of the spacecraft. As you may see, two of the instruments, uh, the focusing array are responsibility of the Chinese colleagues, while the um, LAD and wide field monitor are European responsibility. And Wang and Yuri Evangelista will talk more about the payload concept. Now, let me stress, let me describe just an extract of this EXTP scientific capability. This is a summary of what EXTP could be able to do due to its characteristics, and then what should be possible to explore and what are the scientific drivers to uh, define this requirement. We will have a huge effective area, uh, half square meter focus, there are three square meter collimated with LID that will allow to collect a lot of photons for um, uh, burst oscillation, measuring the black hole spin around accretion in AGN or in black holes, uh, and measuring GR effects. The wide energy range among 0.5 to 30 keV will allow, again, to study multivalent variability and GR effect in accreting sources. We have a CCD-like energy resolution that will allow to cover with great accuracy the ion line, uh, the ion line uh, regimes. The high time resolution and accuracy will allow, of course, to monitor very short variability and to uh, avoid any pile up effect in our instrument. Then we also have polarimetry capability with MDP uh, of about 1.5% to 50 kilosecond in 100 milligram source that will allow to measure polarimetric signature, polarimetric structure of our um, sources and then put strong constraint on geometry. The wide field monitor will perfectly complement all these um, all these characteristics, allowing us to monitor in fancy sources. So, as you have seen, XTP uh, will offer for the first time the most complete diagnostic for compact sources because uh, we will be able to cover spectro uh, spectroscopy, timing, uh, and uh, polarimetry, and together with the model monitoring of transient sources. Even more importantly, we are going to use a combination of this diagnostic. To, um, to resolve systematic effect linked to the model or, for example, um, instrument effects like pileup we have it with XMM for brightest sources. While describing the, the scientific payload in a contest, I would like to uh, stress with you a test case study that is the frame drag precession X-ray binaries. That means they needed to, to measure the fast ion line variability. I would like to show how the characteristic of XTP will allow to cover this scientific case only with a combination of all the diagnostic XTP will offer. Um, the frame dragging in XTP is, uh, I mean, in the case of accreting stellar masses, we call, we have this inner corona probably processing, then illuminating the external part of the disk where the ion line is produced. That means that depending on the 
process of the of the um, uh, dragging of the accretion flow in the inner part, we should observe a variability of the ion line in very short time scale. In particular, this precession will generate a QPO, a quasi-periodic oscillation, and phased with this QPO, we should observe a variability of the ion line. But what do we need to investigate these accretion properties? First of all, we need to monitor the source because we know that this happens when we are dominated by the emission of the disk, but the source is changing its flux. Then we have to monitor the, the source and to know when to look at the source to investigate this topic. Then we need to collect a lot of photon in different phase of the illumination of the disk. That means that we need to collect photon from different phase of the QPO in the source. Then we should, from the spectroscopic point of view, measure the change of the ion line. And I will show you also the variability of the polarization measurement of this inner part that is the corona. And then we show you how XTP will be able to perform all together this diagnostic. This is the, um, the effective area of the LAD and the SFA compared with the RXT, PCA, and Astrosat, for example. In the case of the LAD, the collimated instrument, we have almost an order of magnitude with respect to the PCA. Well, 35 times the XM, XM, but of course XMM is collimated. In the case of the SFA, we have again almost an order of magnitude with respect to both XMM on the Rosita. And uh, we have uh, a factor two at the energy of the ion line with respect to the Y field imager of uh, Athena. Then a lot of effective area and the energy of the line when we need to collect photons. What this means? This means that uh, for an observing uh, time of this, the, the same source I showed before, we should be able to detect this teeny changing of the ion line depending on the QPO phase. Then the SFA plus the lab counts will allow to measure the change of the ion line depending on the QPO phase on the inner part of the corona that is processing. And then this will allow to constrain the physics of the inner part of the corona. This is not the end of the story because as we know, there is also the PFA, the, the polar limited focusing array, with an effective area that is more or less five times the IXP, almost twice uh, the one on my ship, and with the sensitivity 1% MDP in 50 kiloseconds. This is the effective area as compared to the other mission, uh, ship, for example, uh, IXP, for example. Then we should be able on the ion line also to measure the, um, sorry, not the ion line, in the X ray energy range also to measure the polarization signature. Now, um, again, in the same case, in the same scientific case, I would like to show you uh, the corona inside the accretion disk, in the inner part of the accretion disk, uh, is, uh, is uh, processing. And the polarization degree at angle will strongly be affected by strong field gravity like bending. That means that you are going to expect precession changing in geometry. And then we expected to see a, a modulation of depolarization the inner part of the corona. So together with the changing of the ion line profile, we are also expected to observe a variability of the uh, polarization in the corona emission. Again, thanks to the huge number of counts that we should be able to collect with the both SFA and LAD, then to phase with the QPO, we should be able to select the QPO phase, good for the PFA observation, and then to measure the polarization degree and polarization angle, depending on the QPO phase, in the case of the, uh, with the PFA. That means that together with spectroscopy and polarization, we should be able to disentangle both the physics of the corona and the disk and the geometry of the inner corona. And this should be possible only with the combination of the, all these instruments. Then we have also the wide field monitor. It is the largest field of view ever flown with the 300 electron volt resolution a sensitivity of about 3 milligram in 50 kiloseconds. Here you may see the field of view covered by the wide field monitor compared with the Swift BAP, Maxi, and the XT. As I said, it's the wide field monitor will perfectly complement this observation because X-ray binary is transient as well as uh, the large part of the source we would like to observe with the XTP, then we need to know when observe the source. Then the wide field module will tell us when 
the narrow field instrument should point the source. Uh, in addition to that, the wide field monitor will uh, exquisitely um, observe the whole sky. There is an example of an exposure map, and you may easily understand that it will be a powerful uh, time domain machine um, complementing the gravitational wave electromagnetic, um, providing the gravitational wave electromagnetic alert, monitoring transient, and providing GLB alerts. Then uh, the combination of all the instruments of XTP and only the combination of these instruments could allow us to answer the question about accretion, for example, in the case I showed you. Uh, this is an example. The sample I show you is uh, this is a, the, these are the type of the source XTP will observe the, with the total pointing, the needed of a TO, and the science goal. Uh, I've shown an example in the case of black hole transient in all state, but of course, XTP will observe persistent black hole, supermassive black hole in EGN. This should be for the strong field gravity um, uh, topic. Then it will observe rotational power millisecond pulsar, accretion power millisecond pulsar, transition bars of the transient, uh, neutron star of all way, and um, magneta persistent and transient. Then for all the sources that uh, XTP need to observe to reach the scientific goal and then to reach our objective in physics and astrophysics, we need to use a combination of our um, instrument capability. I would like to stress here that uh, in this uh, preliminary uh, observing plan, we just filled with the core science 50% of uh, available time in five years then a large amount of time is available for observatory science because the XCP will be a great machine for observation. Then uh, in order to, uh, to reach all these goals, uh, we also need to have a very I mean, precise and uh, accurate XCP um, operation and uh, system uh, requirements. First of all, to detect transient sources, we require to have at least 50% of the sky accessible but both the narrow field instrument at the same time. We would also to cover with the wide field monitor centennial only one fourth of the sky. So should be able to move to ATO with the narrow field instrument to the transient sources. And uh, the wide field monitor should be, will be also um, able to have a board triggering and localization capabilities it will be fundamental for the trans, for, um, to detect the transient sources. Autonomous viewing, Large than three arc uh, three degree uh, minutes and the transmission of coordinators to the ground. Of course, this will be a, a great task, a key element detecting the electromagnetic counterpart to gravitational wave events or to um, trigger TO in the case of the source like accreting black hole or accreting neutron star uh, and the pulsar. And uh, a large amount of observation with XTP will be performed through the TO observation. I am at you. Um, we have, as I said, a fast up link uh, for TO coordinated and an execution time for the TO that is less than 12 hours. This is our requirements. Uh, as I said, however, uh, XCP will be a, a great uh, and uh, op uh, observatory for the worldwide community. And uh, the specific policy for using data, of course, should be discussed uh, among the participating agency. However, uh, it is expected that uh, the observing plan um, will be uh, designed based on the core science uh, program. However, we will have a guest investigator program to a time allocation time. So something like a guest observer time like uh, XMM or Chandra we have right now, Star or whatever. Uh, this is why we have a science data center uh, that we should be responsible to develop software, to release data, both raw data and um, high products download. Uh, an important task of the SEC will be a quick look analysis because if you have to um, ask for a TO or uh, a following observation of the monitoring, we should be able to have a quick look to the, to the data and to see how to develop our TO. And of course, to manage the guest observer program um, in the case of observatory science. Then, uh, and uh, this is my last slide. I hope to have convinced you that, I'm, but I'm sure uh, it, um, XTP uh, says keyword are astrophysical extreme object in nature. That means that our target will be neutron star, black hole, or exotic stars, maybe. 
it will play a key role in fundamental physics because uh, thanks to our observation on these astrophysical objects, we should be able to test and verify fundamental physics in strong interaction, QED, strong field gravity, and strong density, uh, high density. Uh, as we will listen in, also in this session, XTP will play a key role in multi-messenger astrophysics, uh, be able to detect uh, electromagnetic counterpart to gravitational wave well events or neutrino sources, to be able to fast detect electromagnetic counterparts to fast uh, transient events. And again, as I said, uh, XTP is designed to be a large observatory to address many, many science questions uh, and it will be available to the world community. I'll remind you that 50% of the observing time should be dedicated to observatory science. Let me conclude with the kind of comparison with the mission we have right now and in the, in, the, in the far and close future. Um, about Athena, of course, XTP will be earlier, uh, highly complementary to Athena. Athena is focused uh, to make high resolution spectro spectroscopical observation on weak sources, uh, while, uh, as I showed you, uh, XTP will be a key player in the case of the transient sky with bright sources. And uh, I XP uh, is an exploratory mission we will be launched at the end of this year. And uh, of course, it's much lower effective error. However, IXP will, for the first time, observe X-ray polarization in the sky. And of course, XTP observing program we built open the IXP legacy, depending on what IXP will be observed. But of course, adding again new diagnostic like spectral timing capability and monitoring capability. Finally, there will be SROBEX, uh, NASA mission concept, uh, that, uh, which also is based on the LAD detectors and the large area detectors. However, with respect to XP, of course, we have polarimetry and uh, even in this case, the, 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 the possibility highly complementary. And uh, I will stop here and I thank for your attention. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Anna Sandra. So any questions? Maybe we have two or three minutes to discuss. So it's quite clear, and I find that all the audience are actually in the collaboration. Yeah, Fanjun, I and Alessandra, I have a question for Alessandra. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, the question is about the, the observing plan. You yes. mentioned that uh, we have a 50% uh, availability for observatory science. I was wondering whether there is uh, any constraint in time. So if this 50% is uh, evenly distributed over the mission lifetime, or if it's uh, uh, spread in different uh, fractions over the years. Uh... Well, no, it is, um, it is split in several fractions over the years. And this is just, I mean, a, a collection of what we left uh, for, the, for, the, um, for, the course, for the course science topic. But of course, as I said, the course science, uh, it will be, uh, most of the course science will be uh, depending on the execution of TO or the monitoring of transient sources. Then to now, it, it is not, uh, it is split during the lifetime of the years. However, uh, following the preliminary, preliminary consideration, we think that we should be able to conclude the, the, the core science, also considering the probability of uh, detecting transient sources in the first three years. So maybe it should be possible to allocate the observatory science in a given time. However, in this plan, for example, we didn't include any, uh, I mean, uh, TO repointing due to uh, electromagnetic counterparts of the gravitational wave events. So it could be, I mean, discussed and investigated deeply. Okay, so if you can finish the core program in three years means that uh... At the beginning of the mission, there will be a, a higher balance for the core program than the observatory science, and then it will decrease with time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, very similar to the XM Newton observation. Yeah. 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 Okay, so maybe we stop here and then we move to the next talk, which will be given by Wang Yusa. Uh,
So the top is the design of, of SFA and PFA. So please. So I'll give you 17 minutes of time. Please. Yes, maybe you need to uh, open your microphone. So there's no voice. Uh, it's okay now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, good afternoon and uh, uh, good morning everyone. This is uh, Yusa Wang from my help. Uh, I will introduce this uh, presentation uh, on behalf of SFA and the uh, PFA uh, team. And this uh, presentation is about the design of SFA and the PFA instrument on board the uh, EITP. Uh, this is the outline. First, I will introduce the requirement of SFA and the PFA instrument uh, uh, including the uh, instrument requirement, also uh, including the calibration requirement and the requirement for the satellite planned form. Second, I will introduce the uh, SFA design and the development status. Uh, 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 this section including the optics design and the optics uh, they also including the focal plan camera. And the section is about the PFA design and the development and the uh, state. Uh, finally, we will show our available test facility for uh, EITP and uh, our cal calibration plan. Uh, first is the SFA and the PFA requirements. Uh, this is a, this is a, uh, introduction. <clears throat> As we learn, uh, the EITP is uh, is an international uh, collaboration um, mission uh, where with a, with a huge contribution from Europe and uh, uh, in China. The EITP is a flagship extreme uh, satellite, and um, EITP including four. Uh, payloads, the SFA, uh, LED, PFA, and the WFM. Uh, it's a main scientific goal is to study the state of matter and uh, extreme, extreme condition of uh, density, gravity, and uh, magnetism. Uh, so the most uh, and the uh, important uh, observation mode of uh, EITP is the pointing uh, observation with high accuracy and uh, stability. Uh, for SFA, we have uh, passed a uh, review of SFA requirement uh, uh, last year, and uh, we confirmed the requirement of a science uh, in instrument platform and the calibration uh, from the from this, the performance of SFA, we can find the SFA uh, emphasize on the high sensitivity, uh, high sensitive point uh, uh, observation, and uh, with a uh, very good uh, sensitivity. For the good sensitivity, uh, we need, we need, we also need a very good uh, pointing accuracy and uh, uh, good stability of the pointing. So we analyze the these two uh, par parameters, and uh, we have uh, find the most uh, contribution of point actually is from the set line. Uh, also, we have we have analyzed the requirement and confirm of confirm the requirement of uh, calibration. Uh, there are four parts. First is about the optics, and also we can see the mirror mode. And the second is the filter and the SDD. For SDD, the most and the most work is about the 
uh, the timing and the spectral test and the calibration. Uh, the last is the firmware. Uh, firmware is also important for our work. We, we will check the uh, mode check, mode exchange also, uh, the mode change on the different uh, X-ring source uh, means uh, maximum, maximum flux or a normal. Uh, for PFA, we have also passed the uh, review of requirement and also including the uh, science in, uh, instrument plan from and calibration. Uh, the most the, the most the important uh, performance of PFA is the polar polarization. We we need a very good uh, polar sensitive and uh, we. We think the spurious polarization must be less than one percent. Also, uh, for calibration requirement, uh, the optics uh, is uh, almost the same to the uh, to that of SA, uh, but the GPD is uh, a new a, a, a new detector for for ETB. So. Uh, the polarization test and the time is very important. Uh, the, se the second section I will introduce the SFA design and the development state. Uh, SFA is, uh, is one instrument on board the ERTP. Uh, SFA contains a nine identical telescopes telescope, and uh, uh, for one telescope, uh, it, it is considered of a uh, uh, mirror mode, mirror assembly, and a uh, focal plan camera. Also, other uh, support the structure, supported the structure, and the uh, uh, thermal buffer or, or cover. Uh, if lead, uh, the mirror mirror model is a what one config, configuration um, mirror, and. Uh, for SFA, the focal plan is a multi cell SDD. The, this SDD are from uh, the MPE. And uh, uh, we select the, the SDD because, uh, because of its good energy resolution and uh, good timing performance. Uh, the, uh, this is very uh, suitable for the high sensitivity of. Sensitivity requirement of SAV. Uh, since the effective area is very huge and the timing um, timing performance is good, well, we think uh, uh, this is the most and the powerful uh, ability of SAV. Uh, this is a collaboration of SAV. Uh, I have we are lead the in development of SAV and. Uh, MP will contribute contribute the uh, multi cell SDD detector and the, the uh, corresponding uh, read out ASIC chips. For uh, for the requirement of SFA uh, optics, so uh, first there are line there are line identical mirror modules and the frequency is five point two. Uh, five meters, and uh, this frequency is uh, is defined and uh, confirmed because of the uh, limited of the test facility. Also, for uh, the background the surprise, we because we need a very very high sensitivity uh, point of observation, and uh, in the uh, this. Uh, also, we, we should mention that the, the angulation, angular resolution we, we, call, we call HVD uh, is about the 13 arc second. It's better than the requirement of in the previous slide because this is a design and we, we know the better angular resolution will, will be helpful for our background re rejection. Uh, for the effective area, we can find the uh, SFA is uh, uh, bigger than that of EOCTA and uh, EPIC-PN, but uh, 
uh, less than that of uh, Athena. And this is a simulation. We uh, the, on the center, this is a uh, detect, detector of SFV, uh, line, a line cells, nine cells SBD. Uh, we hope most of the photo, extreme photos can uh, hit the center cells, but uh, uh, the, the HPD is not a, a point, so um, maybe maybe uh, maybe one uh, plus six uh, cells uh, can uh, illuminate by the focused uh, spot. Uh, so we need to do the background check rejection with the outer shell. Out, outer cells is about twelve. Also, we can see that there are very obvious the single reflection from the uh, parabolic and the hyperbolic. So this uh, means that we, if there are two uh, X ring very near, very near, maybe it's difficult to uh, dis distinguish them. And so this is maybe a, li a little uh, restriction of the observation. Uh, for the achievement of the uh, optics, there are two solutions. Uh, the baseline solution is the manufacturer from mid narrow uh, Italy. Uh, the, te the technology in, in mid narrow is, is available and, uh, and successful in past, uh, past X3 uh, mission. Uh, but uh, there may be limit uh, then maybe the limit capacity of product produce uh, products product because uh, we need a uh, more than 50 more than 15 mirror assembly uh, so it's a uh, very uh, it's so many that we maybe need a, a lot of uh, solution so there is a parallel solution uh, it's a uh, it means the manufacturer in Harbin Institute of Technology uh, with the support from uh, IHAB and other institute. Uh, for the FERC plan, uh, the, the 19 cell the SDR were tested in MPE and uh, the performance will give, uh, give us our, if the MOU between I have and uh, um, MP is okay. Uh, for the perform the performance of this as is very important for us because uh, uh, the correcting operating of SD is minus fifteen five. Uh, this is not good for uh, the thermal control with one state tag. So uh, we will do the uh, proto erratic test after we. After the arrival of these uh, SDDs, uh, we want to we want to do the optimal work, and uh, we we hope the final operate op operation operating temperature is from uh, minus sixteen to minus twenty. Uh, since the delivery delivery of the uh, nineteen cells SD will be confirmed until the MOU is okay. So we have, we are integrate a, a SDD array to test our core optical design with SFA, especially we want to know the uh, background rejection uh, function. And uh, we want to know the performance of the, this rejection. Uh, for the thermal, Control. We have do many simulation and analyze the work. Uh, we have designed four kind of heaters to uh, keep the keep keep the temperature of the mirror assembly stable. And uh, we have analyzed the hot case or or cold case. Uh, the temperature is okay. Uh, for the focal plan camera, we have designed. Uh, we, we have uh, controlled the temperature with the tech and the radiator and also other heat pipes. Uh, it's also okay for uh, this design. For the mechanical design, uh, 
we have done many simulation and uh, analyze work. Work, oh, sorry, uh, and uh, uh, on the correct vibration condition, uh, our design now is okay. Uh, the the third section is for PFA design and developer. Uh, PFA is also uh, instrument uh, an instrument uh, on EITB. Uh, PFA include the uh, include the four identical telescope for one. Uh, times zero is consists of uh, mirror assembly and uh, GPD for the plan camera. Mm. Uh, uh, the, the angular resolution of PFA will be better than uh, that uh, of SFA. This is because uh, uh, PFA have the uh, ability of imaging. Uh, so we are select the better uh, Mirror assembly. This is the collaboration of PFA. The I, I have we are need the uh, PFA instrument development, uh, and uh, also include the um, mirror assembly development and the focal plan. Uh, the infant will uh, will develop the new ASIC and uh, uh, support to the. Back, back and the electronics also participate in the calibration and the simulation or analyze package. Uh, for, for Tsinghua University, we are con contribute the physical design and of the instrument and the GPT assembly and test and calibration. Uh, this is the requirement of the PFA objects. Uh, we can see the PFA, uh, the uh, effective area of PFA is uh, better than uh, that of SPE. Uh, for the first plan there, we can see in, the, in this picture, uh, this is a GPD, the operating is uh, uh, from uh, 15 to 25 uh, degree. And uh, this is the field wheel. Uh, this is, this field wheel is not a typical field wheel. Uh, it it contains so many uh, calibration uh, X-ray source, uh, not a many, many uh, filter. And for the electronics, uh, uh, there are DAQ, smoke control, and uh, low uh, voltage or high voltage supply. Uh, this is the functional diagram of uh, PFA. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is uh, PFA have done many works on the uh, in orbit, uh, in orbit uh, polarization source, uh, the simulation without much the test result well. Uh, for the uh, GPT detected self, uh, Tsinghua have developed a cube side named uh, uh, oh, line. Yes, I give you another one minute to finish oh, your work. Uh, and launched in 2008 and works well now. It's very confident for uh, our next uh, PFA design. Uh, finally, mm -hmm. the test facility, our calibration. Uh, there is one sound test facility, Yang Help, uh, is very similar to the Panda X ray facility. Uh, this is inside, uh, there's a very large chamber for. Uh, X ray mirror uh, test and uh, a small facility for detector uh, and uh, focal plan test. Uh, this is our uh, plan. Uh, this is for SFA focal plan detector in the small chamber and also a, 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 a QE, a standard detector uh, from PDB or Chinese uh, helps. Uh, the PFA will also be tested in this uh, facility. And uh, for mirror, we will do many work. Uh, you know, this is one share of EITP uh, objects uh, we have tested in, the, uh, in, our, term, uh, in our facility. Uh, for the telescope, we will integrate, uh, we will uh, do the end-to-end -end test at our facility and check every function and performs uh, one by one. Uh, this is a small uh, summary. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Okay, so thank you, Yusan.
So how about the effective area of the PFA and Ferguson telescopes? I was told that uh, the effective area at the six, uh, no, at a, uh, three Kiwi and uh, cannot uh, meet the requirement with the current design. So do you have any new testing uh, result on that? Yeah, those are the design ones. Do you have any experimental uh, data? Uh, this is a design view, a design value. Yeah. So have you tried the uh, carbon uh, plus gold and coating? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Car carbon uh, are the are the best line for PFA optics. Uh, I mean, this uh, there, there is, this is only the difference of the coating, not the whole design. Uh, the yeah, certainly. Yeah. Okay, so hello. So more questions from other? Hi, Yusa. Uh, I want to ask when the test facility will be ready. I mean the 100 meter test facility in IHA. When will it be ready? Yes. Uh, the facility, the, the uh, WST, uh, WST, uh, EP. EP mission, WSD payload are, are testing, are tested now in our, our facility. And then it will be okay next, uh, next week. Oh, you mean we can use it? We so since the facility is there, so and the, the w, WST of EP is calibrating there. I see. But uh, today, uh, uh, maybe finish the test. Uh, so is, uh, is there any plan to mount uh, polarized X-ray sources on this beam? Polarized uh, X-ray source, you mean? Yes. Uh, we, have, we have designed uh, uh, X-ray, a uh, polar, polarized X-ray source uh, uh, similar to that of uh, um, a straight, an, a straight line the facility in, in NASA. Um, but we, we are designed and we maybe it's uh, available at the end of uh, this year. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Yusa. So now we need to move to the next talk. So Yuri, so please. You were talking about the area in WFM. Yes. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yeah, yeah, very okay. well. Hi, everybody. I'm your Evangelista from uh, IAPS uh, in Rome. And I'm going to, uh, to quickly show the, the sign uh, of the uh, two uh, European contributed instrument to the XTP that, that are uh, the large area detector and the wide field monitor. Uh, okay, these are the science topic, but of course I will skip them because Alessandra already gave uh, a very good description and also all the following speakers will uh, go deep into the scientific um, uh, goals of AXTP. Uh, in these slides uh, I will show you uh, two of the four uh, AXTP uh, instruments, uh, specifically the large area detector. Uh, which has an energy range uh, of 230 GB with an extended energy range of 30 up to 80 GB for uh, out of field of view uh, sources. Uh, a very large effective area of 3.4 uh, square meter. Uh, energy resolution better than 240 GB, full width of maximum and the area online. Uh, collimated field of view of one degree and uh, is based on uh, large area silicon drift detectors uh, for a total of uh, 640 detectors uh, arranged in uh, 40 modules. Uh, the other instrument is the WFM uh, based on the same technology of the SDD so uh, with more or less the same energy range and energy resolution 
a very large uh, field of view and a uh, uh, good ang an angular resolution of fire arc minutes uh, and uh, um, a localization uh, accuracy of better than one arc minutes for uh, high significant sources that means uh, uh, over five sigmas. Uh, starting from the larger detector that you can see in this uh, picture is arranged on the top optical bench around the optics. Uh, the uh, LED is a collimated instrument uh, ca uh, characterized by the um, uh, specification that I already uh, mm, discussed and mm, the uh, effective, the most important uh, uh, characteristics of the LED is the uh, very large uh, effective area of uh, 3.4 square meter that you can see here uh, compared with the RXT uh, PCA and also with the uh, AstroSat and uh, and it's also characterized uh, with a low energy uh, very good low energy response uh, down to uh, 2 keV and uh, an energy resolution of 240 eV. Uh, the Another uh, very important uh, characteristic of the LED is the uh, time accuracy and time resolution, which is better than 10 microseconds, the ability of single photon detection, and also uh, the, uh, the very good the time, uh, which is by requirement uh, better than lower than 10% at one crab uh, X-ray flux. Uh, together uh, with the SFA, APFA, uh, this is the total uh, effective area of the uh, of the XTP instruments uh, and uh, um, this in particular the LED is uh, uh, six times the PCA uh, from a, um, and 35 times the XMM Newton uh, instrument uh, from a point of view of, of uh, effective area but of course uh, is collimated so uh, the background is uh, is larger. The uh, LED key technology uh, is the uh, silicon drift detector, initially developed and designed uh, for bidimensional tracking of ionizing particles at CERN, uh, in particular for the ELIS uh, ETS instrument. Uh, the detectors are um, based on the uh, on linear scaling potential uh, that mm, generate uh, a constant electric field uh, uh, which is directed towards an array of small denodes. Uh, so the uh, charges uh, generated by the interaction uh, of uh, uniting particles or also photons uh, with the silicon substrate are uh, drifted to the anodes uh, in, in a way that a lot to uh, disentangle the detector effective area with the uh, readout capacitance, which is of course uh, one of the main source of noise in uh, solid state detectors. Uh, in <clears throat> Nellis, uh, the uh, the imaging were, was performed uh, by determining uh, the first coordinate by the center of gravity uh, of the charge distribution at the anodes, while the second coordinates, so along the drift axis, uh, was determined uh, measuring the, the time delay, essentially, uh, between the interaction and the charge readout. Uh, this is, of course, will, is different for X-rays, and I will describe uh, that uh, in the wide field monitor slides. Uh, anyway, the detectors were uh, the porting, let's say, of this silicon drift detector for uh, X-ray detection uh, started more than uh, 50 years uh, ago uh, with an um, intense uh, R&D program. Uh, you know, the detectors are designed by INFM 3S in Italy and developed uh, in Italy in a collaboration uh, with INAF, uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler, which is uh, the, manufacturer, uh, the manufacturer of the detectors, Polytechnic of Milan, University of Pavia, and University of Bologna. Uh, the uh, LEDSDD are the largest monolithic uh, uh, silicon drift detector ever built. Uh, the full scale prototype was already produced in 2014 uh, from a six inches wafer. And the, um, each detector sensitive area is 10 by 7 uh, square centimeter. Uh, 
Another very important characteristic is that these detectors uh, have a uh, ultra low uh, leakage current uh, of uh, lower than 200 picoamperes per square centimeter at two room. This allows to uh, obtain very uh, good uh, spectral uh, performance, as you can see in this plot. Uh, these uh, were um, these performance were measured with a, a prototype detector uh, read out by custom uh, uh, electronics, uh, simulating the uh, end of life uh, LED expected uh, current. So, uh, which includes both the intrinsic leakage current on the detector and the radiation damage induced leakage current, uh, the which is five picoampere per anode and the end of life. Um, the energy resolution at the 55 uh, uh, iron uh, uh, source lines uh, is uh, was measured at two, uh, 205 uh, EB fluid of maximum. Uh, other key technologies of the LED are, of course, the readout ASIC, uh, which are, um, are developed by CA in France. Uh, the readout of the signal by the SDD is uh, uh, subdivided in two parts. The analog readout, uh, which is obtained by um, uh, uh, the IDFX uh, ASIC, which is a 3200 uh, analog ASIC uh, with uh, already flown on the solar orbiter. Uh, the ASIC contains uh, 32 full spectroscopic chains uh, of, from the charge preamplifier, of course, and uh, with a low noise uh, and uh, low power uh, consumption. The digitalization of the signals is obtained uh, uh, with another ASIC, uh, which is called OB1, uh, or, or again developed by CA in, uh, uh, in France, uh, which is a, a multi channel ADC uh, with a, a 13 bit uh, resolution and a very fast conversion, conversion time of uh, 2.6 microseconds. Uh, also, uh, the OB1 has a low power consumption of 0.8 milliwatts per channel. Uh, third uh, techno key technology is the um, microchannel co um, collimator uh, or microporotics optics that are manufactured by North Night Vision Technology in, uh, in China. Uh, the, also on the MPO collimator, uh, I'll, Long and tense already uh, was uh, carried out in the last years. Uh, the collimator is composed by lead glass uh, and has the same uh, dimensions of the uh, detectors. Uh, the pore aspect ratio is uh, 60 to 1 uh, with a 5 millimeter thick uh, pore and uh, 83 micron diameter pore. Uh, very high uh, lead content, uh, more than 40%, and uh, very low uh, uh, potassium-40 content, uh, which means uh, very low intri uh, intrinsic radioactivity. Uh, the overall ratio is 75%, thus allowing for a very high throughput, and uh, also particular uh, care was put in the uh, internal pore roughness uh, in order to avoid um, um, grazing reflection for uh, uh, soft X-rays, and in the uh, port-to-port and port-to-surface alignment, uh, in order to optimize the the, the system response. Uh, the, uh, here below, you can see also a couple of rocking curves of the collimator acquired at two different energies. Uh, the uh, LED has a, a modular uh, structure uh, based on uh, uh, the, the unit element, which is uh, the, called the module, uh, uh, which is composed by 16 uh, detectors, collimators, optical filters, uh, and front-end uh, electronic boards, and by two uh, back -end, uh, module back-end electronic boards and power supply unit. Uh, the um, electronics uh, <clears throat> is developed in uh, uh, in Germany and uh, EIT, and the module backend uh, is uh, uh, based on uh, AirTax SL FPGA. Uh, 
10 modules uh, are uh, read out, commanded by a panel backend, uh, which is again uh, developed in Germany and uh, based uh, on a um, uh, RTZ4 uh, FPGA and the instrument control unit uh, is uh, essentially the uh, the major controlling element on the instrument and the interface of the instrument with the spacecraft. Uh, just to give you an overview of the um, LID uh, product tree, uh, the institute collaborating uh, to the LED are uh, reported here below. Uh, in Italy, we have uh, INF, uh, INFN, FBK, IOT in Germany, CI in France, CBK in Poland, which, uh, which is in charge of developing the power supply unit. DPNC is uh, Switzerland, which is in charge of developing the front end board and also the integration. Uh, um, ASUS Frentech in the Czech Republic, which is uh, uh, in charge of the all the mechanical uh, and thermal design of the module, uh, uh, CAS and VT uh, for the optical filters and capillary plates, and the University of Vienna in Austria, which is uh, uh, in charge of the onboard software. Uh, the other instrument, um, European instrument on board XTP is the uh, wide field monitor, uh, <clears throat> which uh, primary scientific goals uh, are to provide triggers for the um, observation of the XTP narrow field instruments, and, uh, that means uh, LAD, SFA, and, PSA, and PSA, uh, in particular to uh, detect uh, and study stellar black hole transient, neutron star transient, and also uh, state uh, changes in accretion power sources. Uh, uh, and, and to do that, uh, you, we need a, a field of view as wide um, uh, as possible, and also uh, a good uh, angular resolution and the energy resolution. Uh, the um, uh, WFM uh, characteristic also allows for secondary goals, so that uh, means uh, the long-term monitoring of uh, X-ray sources. Uh, X-ray and gamma ray burst uh, detection, and also providing uh, quick dissemination of uh, uh, burst position via B2. Uh, and uh, this is also, of course, related to provide and uh, study uh, gravitational wave events alerts uh, for uh, both quick dis dissemination and also searches for uh, electromagnetic counterpart after. Uh, uh, gravitational wave uh, event. Uh, the same also apply, of course, for fast radio burst. So that uh, uh, this is a new scientific goal that was introduced in the last year. Uh, the WFM is a <clears throat> coded mask uh, imager uh, based on the, uh, as I said, uh, on the same technology uh, detector te technology that is uh, silicon diff detectors and uh, each of the detectors provide a, a quasi bidimensional imaging capabilities i will uh, go in uh, deeply in this in this uh, later and uh, um, also which is very interesting for a wide field monitor photon by photon uh, detection uh, these are the main requirements characteristics, uh, uh, very good uh, point source uh, and uh, location accuracy and angular resolution, uh, very good sensitivity, which is lower, uh, better than 5 milligram in 50 kiloseconds, uh, and of the order, actually should be around 3.5 milligram, a very large field of view, uh, an energy range from 2 to 50 kV with an energy resolution better than 500 eV. Uh, time resolution, which is also uh, uh, very, very good for uh, photo by photo events uh, with 10 microsecond time, uh, time resolution, while the onboard images will be um, integrated for 300 seconds. Uh, the uh, image maximum uh, downlink delay will be three hours, while the uh, the, broadcast, the broadcast of triggers via Beidou will be uh, much faster uh, with a maximum delay time of 30 seconds. And the expected number of triggers is more than five per day. Uh, the uh, Wi-Fi monitor, uh, the PI um, Institute is uh, in Spain, is uh, Margarita Hernans. And uh, the, this is the structure of one camera, uh, which is composed, of course, for, uh, with, by a pretensioned coding mask. Uh, um, frame and collimator, a beryllium filter uh, that 
that is um, um, arranged upon the four silicon drift detector, which have more or less the same design of the LED, but uh, um, uh, finer anode segmentation. Uh, each uh, detector uh, is glued, is a sandwich with the uh, front end and also uh, with the uh, thermal, passive thermal control of the detector and uh, is connected uh, uh, to the back-end uh, electronic, uh, which is uh, uh, just underneath the detector tray. Uh, the Institute uh, involved in the development uh, of the Wi-Fi monitor are, of course, Spain, German, Germany, uh, Italy, uh, Poland, France, uh, Turkey, Netherlands, and, uh, of course, the prime is China. The, um, the Wi-Fi monitor shares uh, 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 with the LED uh, not only the detector, but also the ASIC design. Uh, the uh, Wi-Fi monitor is uh, uh, having a, a quasi 2D um, special uh, resolution, uh, so angular resolution uh, uh, on each detector. Uh, each uh, um, unit of the Wi-Fi monitor is composed by two cameras with the orthogonal orientation of the detectors, and the three camera pairs are organized on the uh, as this uh, show here uh, with a um, line of sight uh, at uh, zero, that is the same line of sight of uh, the uh, PFA, uh, LAD, and SFA, and minus 60 and plus 60 degrees uh, to obtain a total uh, field of view of 180 degrees uh, per 90 degrees. And uh, if we compare uh, the XTP Wi-Fi monitor field of view instant field of view uh, with uh, the most relevant facility that uh, for example maxi uh, but or also uh, the old sky model on board the rxt uh, we can see how the uh, weapon model will be able to monitor a very large part of the sky uh, in each moment of the mission also uh, the combination of the this very large field of view with the spectral resolution and, and uh, uh, imaging capabilities down to 2KB uh, make the wave view monitor uh, an unprecedented instrument for X-ray monitoring. The uh, the detector on the um, wave view monitor uh, are have a finer segmentation of 169 microns. Uh, 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 with respect to the LED, which is uh, 970 microns, and uh, the um, uh, during the, uh, after the photo interaction, the charge cloud generated by the interaction uh, drifts and uh, diffuses uh, towards the anodes. Uh, the with this uh, uh, small uh, anode pitch, uh, it's possible to sample the charge cloud with several anodes. Uh, and so one coordinates uh, of the interaction uh, can be easily uh, determined by the center of gravity of the charge distribution. Uh, but uh, the charge distribution with- Yuri, you have another two minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, also uh, uh, encodes the, uh, the information on the drift distance, so on the other coordinates. And uh, this allows for uh, uh, bidimensional imaging capabilities uh, with a, a special resolution, which is of the order of 80, 100 microns in the anode direction and this of the order of uh, six, eight millimeters, depending on the energy of the signal to noise ratio on the signal along the drift direction. Uh, com by composing the images uh, acquired by two orthogonal camera in one unit, uh, we can obtain uh, bidimensional images. And uh, here you can see a couple of uh, example. The first one is obtained with a standard co cost correlation method and uh, uh, an observation of the galactic center and a uh, uh, lot of sources, uh, uh, more than I think 20 sources, 21 sources are detected here. Uh, but we are also developing another um, imaging, uh, um, uh, another uh, software uh, which uh, uh, um, make use of the uh, maximum likelihood method and uh, which has 
already demonstrated that to be very uh, efficient and very sensitive to sources. So this is my last slide with a summary of the Wi-Fi monitor and the LED characteristics, and I, I think I can finish here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Questions? So how, how about the, uh, your test result on the coordinators? Uh, yes, the, um, uh, we are performing, uh, we are following the, the development on the collimators uh, and, uh, and uh, each uh, new collimator is tested in, uh, has been tested in our facility. And uh, as I said before, uh, this allowed to uh, fine tune uh, uh, most parameters. Uh, one overall, I would say is the internal uh, poor roughness, which is very important to limit the background. And uh, essentially the collimators are, uh, the last collimator uh, are in spec. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this uh, um, I would say this is a very good um, results, especially if we consider uh, the fast development time that NNBT uh, um, as provided uh, uh, for uh, for the optimization of these collimators. Thank you. So, if no question, we can move to, uh, to the next talk. Uh, Anna Vaz. So, Anna, please. So Anna, are you online? Yes, I am. Just setting up my screen. Hold on a second. Okay, good. All right, hopefully you can now see my slides. Um, so I'm going to move a, a little bit from the discussion of the instrumental capabilities to talk about the kind of science um, that EXTP is going to deliver. Um, I'm, I'm the co-chair of, co of the Dense Matter Working Group, um, so I'll focus uh, mostly on that, but I'm also going to talk about what the Strong Gravity Working Group um, is doing, but there are also further talks to come in the session that will focus in this on more, in more detail. So one of the, the big questions that we want to address um, with EXTP um, is the question of the nature of matter in very extreme conditions. Um, and this is you know, a much wider question than something we're just going to do with the XTP. Um, so what I'm showing here essentially is, is our kind of parameter space of the state of matter um, in temperature essentially versus chemical potential or density. Um, basically all of the kind of regular matter around us sits down really in this bottom left hand corner. And what we would like to understand here, yeah, what happens then as we push matter towards extreme conditions of temperature or density. Um, this is not something that we're able to calculate at present from first principles. Um, because of computational difficulties. Um, so instead, what we have to do is to pursue that with experiment, um, with observation, um, and then test that against phenomenological models, and then try and link that back to the fundamental physics. Now, coming towards these extremes, um, we may be talking about the formation, for example, of deconfined quark states um, at the high extremes over here. Um, some of these things we can explore in the laboratory. Um, heavy ion collision experiments, for example, are able to explore the high temperature, low to intermediate density regime um, to look for potential phase transitions. Um, but neutron stars actually allow us to explore a completely new and unique parameter space, which is the very high density, low temperature regime, where in principle we can reach up to a few times um, normal nuclear density. Um, we can explore highly neutron rich states of matter that we simply cannot explore in the laboratory. And we also have the potential for stable states of strange matter to form, which is not something, again, that you can do with collider experiments. Um, and I should say briefly that neutron star mergers um, occupy this middle ground a little bit more towards the high temperature regime. But just to put the, the overall picture of where neutron stars sit in context. 
Now, in order to link this to, to the astrophysics, to something that we can measure and that then takes us back towards the nature of ultra dense matter, um, we can do this thankfully using the stellar structure equations for neutron stars, the relativistic stellar structure equations, um, because one of the ingredients that goes into that is the equation of state, the relationship between pressure and density. And that is something that depends essentially on the microphysics, on the unknown nuclear physics. Um, it depends, for example, on, on the types of particles that are present. Do we only have you know, primarily neutrons with some protons in there? Are we dealing with the confined quark material? Do we have stable states of strange matter present in there? And then it depends also not only on the composition, but also on the nature of the forces between those particles, none of which we understand terribly well. So basically this, give, this plot gives you some idea of the kind of question space that we are dealing with, taking different equation of state models for different compositions and force descriptions, um, rolling those through the stellar structure equations, um, and what falls out um, in this case is the mass radius relationship associated with each one of those models. And I'm just showing a subset of possible examples basically here with different states of matter. Um, so in principle, if we are able to measure the mass radius relationship for neutron stars um, across the range of masses and at the few percent level, in principle, we can recover and reconstruct the mass radius relation, the associated equation of state, and hence the dense matter nuclear physics. So in order to do this, um, what EXTP is going to be using is, is X-rays essentially coming from the surface of the star. These are X-rays that are coming from deep within the potential well, and those have to pick up then um, the signatures of various different relativistic effects, both general and special relativistic effects, as they propagate towards the observer. And then by modeling that emission as it is detected, we're able to recover in principle mass and radius um, from that X-ray emission. So this will be the primary technique that EXTP is going to use basically to get at dense matter to measure the masses and radii of neutron stars. Um, it's a new technique and it's called pulse profile modeling and it takes advantage of not only the X-ray emission from the surface, but also the rotation of the star as well. Um, and this little movie just gives you some idea of some of the relativistic effects and the kind of effects that they can have. Um, if you have a neutron star with a, a hotter emitting region on the surface, as the star rotates, the flux goes up and down. The spectrum of the radiation also changes. And you can see that once you take into account strong gravity, light bending effects, lensing effects, for example, um, in this case, you can still see around the back of the star. Um, and so the flux never drops to zero. And that's just one of the effects that we take advantage of. Um, so for pulse profile modeling, what we do is we build up a picture of not only the flux, basically as the star rotates, but also how the spectrum changes as well. Um, so we're breaking it out by both spectral and timing information. Um, the basic idea then is that we build a model of that process. Um, we understand neutron star space times fortunately extremely well. Um, so if we put you know, a hotspot of a particular size, shape and location on the surface, uh, we can predict very well what that emission will look like by the time it reaches a distant observer as it propagates towards us. Um, when we are doing this pulse profile modeling process, we're comparing to high quality data. We need to have some idea also of how our instrument responds, based on how it receives and processes that information. And because we're dealing with a multi-parameter model, it includes not only the mass and radius of the star, but also the hotspot properties, um, again, size, location, some atmosphere model, um, interstellar absorption, the distance to the star, for example, some of which we may have prior information on. Um, basically, we have a multi-parameter model. We need to survey that parameter space. Um, so we're doing large-scale Bayesian inference, and that typically then involves supercomputer uh, calculations as well in order to survey that, uh, that entire parameter space. Um, that sounds uh, a rather complicated process. However, fortunately, we know that it works. Um, the reason why we know that it works is that there is now a dedicated mission using this technique um, called NICER, the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. Um, NICER is currently installed on the International Space Station. Um, you can see it here, <coughs> basically against the solar panels of the space station. Um, and what NICER is doing is, is exploiting this technique for about five or six um, rotation-powered millisecond X-ray pulsars. Um, so these are very, very stable systems. Some of them are in binaries, but they're not accreting. Um, the thermal emission on the surface is associated with the magnetic poles of the star and uh, from particles in the magnetosphere impacting the surface and heating it up. And we are essentially applying this technique um, to these very, very long data sets that NICER, uh, which is much smaller than EXTP will be, um, is able to build up. So we've now run through the pulse profile modeling process for two sources, 
uh, for NYSA and we have more to come. Um, and this is just to give you some idea of these first results from NYSA. Um, I'm showing here 68% and 95% um, credible intervals on mass and radius for the first two stars that we have measured. A um, whole slew of papers coming from the collaboration down here uh, for reference. Um, so what you can see is that, the, you know, again, the technique works, uh, which is really nice. We're able to break degeneracies. Um, the results that we have so far on radius are about at the 10% levels, so perhaps a little bit larger than we would like to really home in on the equation of states. Uh, but you can already see that we're starting to rule out um, some of these softer equations of states, for example, to rules the left-hand side. Um, and this is really good because it shows for EXTP, again, the technique is going to work. These rotation-powered millisecond pulsars are also a source class that EXTP will be able to look at with its much, much larger effective area, also targeting, targeting fainter sources. Um, so this is kind of a guaranteed science win, essentially, for EXTP. NICER has also lets us work through some of the complications in the analysis pipeline. Uh, we now know how important it is, for example, to have good background estimates and a good understanding of how the instrument works as well. Um, so that's also been good practice for what we will do with the XTP. Um, EXTP, though, is really going to take this whole technique to the next level. Um, so in addition to be able to expand our rotation-powered millisecond pulsar sample um, and simply get much tighter measurements because the large effective area lets us build up far more counts and the quality of the measurement you make you know, expands with the number of counts that you get. Um, because EXTP has a much broader band energy response than NICER, it goes to much higher energies. Um, essentially, we're going to be able to expand this to accreting neutron stars with hotspots as well. Um, so that would be accretion powered millisecond pulsars, also thermonuclear burst oscillation sources. And the wonderful thing about those is that they are generally much faster rotating than the rotation powered millisecond pulsars that NICER is looking at. And again, the quality of the constraints should get better the faster the star spins, because we can take advantage then of, of the rotation getting closer effectively to the speed of light. Um, so that helps us. Um, EXTP also, of course, has polarimetry capability, and that also adds a lot because it provides an additional constraint on the geometry of the system, which is one of the parameters in the model. Um, so again, if we have prior information on that, that will really help um, to pin things down more tightly, uh, which is something that we now already know. Um, the other very nice thing about doing accreting neutron stars is that, for example, um, we have a number of stars that have accretion-powered pulsar hotspots and also thermonuclear burst oscillation hotspots. Um, and this means that we can apply the pulse profile modeling technique to both types of hotspot. So in addition to having more sources, we can also make cross checks. So taking the same star and applying different techniques to cross check the mass and radius. Uh, and for example, we can also do burst spectroscopy in general on these stars as well. So we have cross checks that we simply do not have for NISA. Um, some things are a little more challenging. Um, the hotspots tend to be variable um, compared to the NISA sources. But again, the large effective area and being able to take you know, good data in short amounts of time will really help us to mitigate this. And I should mention, in addition to this primary technique that we're using for dense matter, there are other techniques we can use as well, um, such as looking for very faint um, pulsations, basically for pulsars, so trying to get measurements of high spin rates uh, from accreting neutron stars. And that would also, for example, provide a very clean constraint on dense matter as well. One of the other things we can do is to use techniques to do with the accretion disk. Um, but before I, so that, that will also provide some additional cross checks as well. Um, in terms of outcomes we can expect of our understanding of dense matter, um, this is from some simulations we did a couple of years ago, um, again, of showing where we might be in, in terms of our understanding of the overall mass radius relationship. Um, and this is kind of our, our current status, basically shown here on the left. Um, it will get a little bit better, I think, with the nicer measurements to come, but, but maybe not a huge amount. Uh, and basically, one, one important thing is that what we're seeing here in the inferred mass radius relationship is that the priors on the equation of state models still matter quite a lot, even as we bring these first measurements in. Um, with EXTP, where we expand the source sample and we make much tighter measurements as well, uh, we finally expect to be in, in the data dominated regime for the mass radius relationship. And again, things will get much, much tighter. So that is just to give you some idea from our simulations of what we would expect. Moving now essentially onto the strong gravity side of things. Um, in, in our dense matter studies, we're effectively using relativity as a tool to do our pulse profile modeling, but we also want to study with EXTP the behavior of matter in strong gravity um, as an end in itself. And accreting compact objects actually allow us to do this. Um, so in particular, 
Um, X-ray measurements of black holes can be used to infer both the mass and the spin of the black hole population. Um, so this is really important to understand you know, the general properties of the black hole population, um, in particular black hole formation and growth, um, but also, for example, how the spin is powering outflows, um, jets and the connection to supernovae, hypernovae and GRBs. So these are all important ingredients in our general understanding of black holes. Um, in principle, we can use X-rays to study not only um, kind of stellar mass black holes, but also active galactic nuclei, so orders of magnitude in principle in mass. Um, what we want to do with the XTP in this regard is very complementary um, to gravitational wave ob observations, which focus on dynamical space-time observations, um, because we are really going to be focusing on static strong gravity space-times. Um, now, so basically we have various different sources of emission um, in the vicinity of the black hole that we're able to observe and to play with um, with the XTP. Um, for example, we have contributions from a corona, we have contributions from the accretion disk itself. Um, we have an unknown geometry perhaps in the system and we have variability um, in the accretion rate. Um, so this brings complications in um, and many of the phenomena that we want to study and use to get at black hole mass and spin um, have only been seen, for example, in very time averaged sense with previous telescopes. Uh, and this allows degeneracies to creep in in the modeling uh, with things like the emission components uh, and the geometry of the system. And so it can be quite tricky to isolate the mass and the spin um, explicitly out of that. Um, so EXTP is really going to bring essentially a step change in here. Um, this is because essentially you have, you know, the much larger effective area, you're able to take much more data in a short amount of time and finally start to resolve things really on the timescales of interest. Um, so the, the diagnostics that EXTP is going to use to get at black holes, the idea is to measure black hole spin and mass using various different independent techniques. Um, so for example, um, to look at relativistically broadened disk reflection, basically for example, from the iron line, as well as from the continuum, um, because you have again effectively pilot free data from the large area detector, you get a very short time scale view um, of the stellar mass black holes. Um, we're also going to be able to do um, Doppler tomography for active galactic nuclei. So again, looking basically at orbiting hotspot variability and being able to focus in finally on the fast stuff very close to the black hole and remove some of the degeneracies due to the complexity of the absorption components. Um, the team are also going to be able to do continuum fitting, um, looking at the disk thermal emission in the soft state um, of black holes where the thermal emission dominates. Um, and for example, you can also then use the polarimetry information, basically looking at the polarization angle and how that changes basically as well as an independent method. Um, and the figure shown here shows you the measurement of polarization degree and angle um, from a simulated 150 kilosecond observation, basically of GRS 1915. Um, what it shows is the dependence on spin with blue showing the model and black shows you the simulated data. So essentially we are going to be able to distinguish using the polarimetry very, very carefully what the, black, what the black hole spin is. And that's then an independent constraint to the other methods. We're also going to be able to use both low and high frequency QPOs basically across the timing range. Uh, for example, as Alessandra mentioned in her talk, I'm looking at phenomena caused by lens steering precession of the inner flow basically and looking at what happens as the disc essentially moves in and out right down to the ISCO. And so be able to resolve things and looking at things as a function of QPO phase is going to be really important in helping to push this out. So essentially we have various different measures, again, cross checks. Um, the large area of EXTP brings down the statistical counting er error. And also this short time scale allows us essentially to remove the systematics due to the confusions, for example, of the geometry and the different absorption components. So we get various different independent measurements of mass and spin. And of course, as a, a side dish to all of that, you're also going to be probing the geometry and the flow of matter close to the black hole better as well, using techniques like reverberation mapping, um, looking in, in high quality spectra, looking at what's happening with winds and outflows as well. So all of this black hole astrophysics stuff coming into. So just to summarize, um, dense matter and strong gravity are both going to be advanced by EXTP. And that's because of its large area, its broadband coverage and its ability to offer spectral timing polarimetry capability. And we expect major advances in both of these areas. 
One of the absolute key things that EXTP offers, um, which we haven't been able to do previously, is the power to cross-check using multiple techniques and hence weed out any systematic errors in our modeling. And again, for example, for NISA, we're not able to do this for the NISA sources. We will be able to do it for the EXTP sources. And in addition, of course, to our, our understanding of the fundamental physics of these systems, you can also expect very large jumps in our understanding of the astrophysics of both neutron stars and black holes. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Anna. So, any question? Uh, actually, I have one, this is Marco. Uh, yeah. Anna, do, do you expect that NICER has reached the, the best they can do on the, on the um, error circles, or do you expect they could, be, could actually improve in the, with the new observations or extended observations? Right, we have one source for which we are expecting a better measurement, um, and that is P PSR J0437, um, because that is a star for which we have a prior measurement of the mass from radio timing at about 3% level. Um, so that's a 1.4 solar mass pulsar, um, very, very well constrained. And we expect that to lead to a simultaneous improvement in the radius constraint. So I think we ought to get one that's about three, four, five percent. We're working on that one right now. Um, for the others, I think things will improve. So we now have an extended data set, for example, on the first source that we analyzed. Um, we've got data sets about double the size now. Um, so one interesting question is, is the scaling with the number of photons you know, exactly what we expected or is that going to be different? Um, so I think things will improve, um, but those are then, you know, the brightest sources are then done. Um, we have one more star with a, a mass constraint, uh, which is PSR J1614, um, so that will help a little bit. So things, things will improve a bit, um, but maybe not terribly dramatically, but one source with a tight measurement. Okay, so the more difficult question is, uh, would EXCP provide uh, tighter constraints with respect to those ones? Yes, I expect so. So there's two things going to be coming in there. One is just, yeah, the sheer number of photons you can build up, basically, it is really important. Um, and it's then the letter sample a little bit better, I think, for stars that have a more favorable geometry. Um, you know, the angle you look at the star matters. Um, we, you know, with EXT, sorry, with NICER, we just kind of take what we're given. Um, because we have more sources we can target potentially with the XTP, um, we're going to be able to be a bit more picky, I think, about where we spend our time. Uh, we should get a wider spread of masses. And I said, one of the real bonuses is being able to cross check. So apply you know, two different types of pulse profile modeling to the same star to really weed out any systematic errors if they're there in the system. So yeah, I do expect EXTP will provide much tighter constraints. Okay, thanks. Okay, so yeah, thank you, Anna. Yeah, so now we move to, to to talk about Alexandro Drago. I don't know whether I pronounce it correctly or not. Perfect, perfect. Thanks a lot. And okay, uh, so. thank you for this uh, possibility of uh, presenting um, some uh, of the recent results of our work, and in particular, how it's connected with um, what the XTP can measure in, uh, in the hopefully near future. Uh, I just put this slide in case somebody is interested to, to dig a little more into what I am rapidly presenting today. Um, so let me start from uh, some consideration that I think is quite uh, robust and very useful in order to put things in perspective. Um, there are a few papers, this is an example, it's not the only paper, that have essentially shown, uh, I really would say in a very clear and convincing way, that uh, if you measure the, the radius of an object having a mass uh, of the order of 1.4 solar masses, uh, it is uh, uh, impossible to have a radius smaller than roughly 11.5 kilometers, unless, unless there is a, a very strong, phase transition inside the compact object. Uh, as I said, this result uh, uh, has been confirmed by, by other papers. And so what does it mean to have a uh, um, strong first order phase transition? Essentially, it means to have uh, production of uh, the confined quarks and uh, 
production of the confinement works in a very, uh, so to say, intensive way in which uh, you have, uh, in particular, first order phase transition with uh, it uh, uh, released, etc. So uh, let me mention that there is a, a scenario describing this possibility, um, is this twin star scenario summarized, for instance, in this paper. And uh, let me uh, stress one point of this uh, twin star scenario. In this twin star scenario, what they uh, uh, predict is that there is a, a transition from uh, larger radii to smaller radii, eh? from larger radii to smaller radii with the increase of the mass. And uh, this transition is uh, due in this scenario to the formation of uh, an object that is not entirely made of quarks, but contains at the center a significant amount of quark matter. So this is what is called the twin star scenario or third family. And these are essentially the opposite respect to what we have instead studied in the last many years. Unfortunately, the, the, the name that you're choosing for this scheme is uh, is a little bit confusing because we called it two families, but uh, it's a completely different scheme in the sense that in this scheme, what we assume is that uh, you can have uh, normal neutron stars, uh, neutron stars uh, for which at a certain moment increasing the mass, uh, you start producing uh, resonances, hyperons, etc. And because of that, uh, which is a very natural situation, the radius of the star decreases, but the equation of state becomes so soft that you don't reach two solar masses. So what are the objects of two solar masses? In this scheme, the object of two solar masses are strange quark stars that also Anna was mentioning in her talk. Objects entirely, entirely made of strange quark matter. So it's really the opposite, if you notice, respect to the previous scheme, because in this scheme, the objects which have a relatively low mass can have a small radius, while the objects with a large mass also have a large radius. Of course, the big question is uh, what do we know concerning the radii of uh, objects having a mass of, I don't know, 1.3, 1.4 solar masses. And uh, there have been a, a lot of papers discussing possibility that the radii are small. And we, we, we know that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of these uh, uh, analyses are model dependent. So it, it's difficult to understand how, how, how conclusive are these analyses. But of course, they exist. And very nice, uh, I, from what I understood uh, uh, from the talk of Anna and also reading the papers by EXTP, it, uh, EXTP will be able to reanalyze some of the sources uh, which were at the basis of these conclusions. And this is extremely important. So uh, let's go back. What do we know now concerning uh, the radii? And uh, of course, NICER has provided some fantastic new uh, results. And let me uh, summarize uh, here these results by NICER together with a few other uh, results. And uh, this uh, two uh, contour, the brown and the dark red, corresponds to two uh, independent analysis of the last object that is being studied by NICER that appeared just a few weeks ago, this uh, analysis, while the previous analysis by NICER is this uh, sepia contour. Okay. Well, this other object here corresponds to the result of analyzing uh, the event of focus 17 uh, in gravitational waves. So um, there is this paper by, by Miller, which is one of the two uh, uh, analyses that I was quoting. And in this paper, uh, Miller and, and co-workers, uh, they put together the nicer results uh, together with this analysis uh, of the gravitational wave emission of uh, August uh, uh, 17. And, uh, and they conclude that essentially they can put a rather uh, tight constraint 
on uh, the radii, both of objects having a mass about 1.4 solar masses and uh, objects having a mass of 2. Point something solar masses. So from this figure, um, from these limits, one can conclude that certainly these type of objects that uh, have been studied by NICER are rather stiff. And uh, you can, for instance, try to present a few represent representative cases uh, of equation of state satisfying these limits by Miller et al. And if you take these three equations of state, which are rather well known, you can see that they essentially span completely the region allowed by nicer results. The green curve is instead a strange for star. I am going to comment on that in a, in a second. So you see these three first lines correspond to what can you do if you think that there is only one family of, uh, of, of neutron stars, which type of equation of state can be used? And these are three very representative examples. It's funny that the, the MPA one is really passing through the center of, of this limit. So everything is clear. Well, maybe not. I mean, we are lucky that still we, we can investigate something uh, of nuclear physics. And uh, uh, let me show uh, a result that uh, is uh, somehow, how to say, different from the orthodox interpretation of uh, that I presented with these three curves. And the, the point is that uh, if you assume that strange quartz stars exist, objects entirely composed of quarks, entirely composed of quarks, then you can make a Bayesian analysis, that's what we did here, using, for instance, these objects, the information coming from these objects. And this Bayesian analysis provides these uh, red lines, okay? And funny enough, when this analysis was completed, nicer results appeared, and the nicer results for this object sits really very nicely on, on these lines, okay? So, uh, we have not used uh, this uh, later result of NISA to produce uh, our Bayesian analysis, but as you can see, um, it, this Bayesian analysis satisfies very well the, 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 the latest result of NISA. So what can one conclude from this? That uh, uh, probably the, the result of, of NISA and, and also the study of a few other objects uh, are suggesting the existence uh, of compact stars, which are definitively uh, rather stiff, there is not really an indication for the moment, at least of, of a softening of the equation of state going uh, uh, to larger masses. Uh, it goes up more or less uh, as a straight line. So this uh, uh, maybe put some strain on the twin star scenario. Recall this twin star scenario is the opposite scenario in which you get uh, uh, smaller radii when you increase the mass, exactly the opposite respect to what we are suggesting. So, okay, this, the, the result of NICER for us are, are very interesting and we, 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 we try to interpret them as strange core stars. Um, but uh, the crucial point of, of these two family scenario, of course, is that there is another family, as I was mentioning, and this other family is made of uh, ordinary neutron stars. Well, actually, a neutron stars containing resonances, etc. It is very funny that uh, it exists uh, uh, an analysis, after more than one analysis, indicating that if you study the millisecond pulsar, the distribution of the masses of millisecond pulsar with a white dwarf companion, uh, you end up with uh, this uh, bimodal distribution. This is what you get from these papers by Antoniali et al. and Tauris et al. And funny enough, uh, if you look, uh, you see that this first Gaussian sits uh, exactly where we would have uh, our first family, our neutron stars. And uh, this uh, would correspond very nicely to the second family, to the strange core star. But of course, one cannot jump to conclusion again, because uh, this uh, is a subset of all the uh, neutron stars and a lot of uh, um, problems concerning evolution of the objects need to be taken into account before coming to any conclusion. 
So the last two slides, uh, what can one learn in a very synthetic way from the measurement of TADI? Uh, first, let me summarize in this rough guide to dense matter in compact objects. Imagine that we measure radii of objects uh, having a mass of about uh, 1.4 solar masses. And imagine that we systematically get radii of the order of 13 kilometers of, or more. Then this means uh, that the, the density uh, is rather small because uh, the larger the radius, the smaller the density. And that implies essentially that uh, there is no reason to, to, to make too many speculations. These objects are probably composed mostly, at least, by neutrons, protons, so nucleonic stars. Of course, there is a wide range of radii for which several possibilities exist. Uh, this could be hyperonic stars. They were present in, in the slide of Anna could be normal hybrid stars. I'm not speaking about the twin stars, just objects where at the center you start forming some of the confined quarks. But uh, from, uh, from, uh, from our viewpoint, of course, the most interesting case would be if it, if it exists really, uh, uh, if really they exist objects having a radius smaller than 11.5 kilometers. Because as I said, that would imply a strong first order phase transition and the twin star scenario maybe is already been ruled out by nicer observation. So this is my last slide. And uh, which can be therefore the role of EXTP? Well, uh, one important point that was mentioned is uh, EXTP can measure, can study same objects with more than one technique. So EXTP will, for what I understand, analyze some of the objects which were at the, at the origin of a speculation of having small radii with more than one technique, and that is fantastic. But let me just be very concrete. Uh, let's concentrate just on one type of object, these rotation-powered pulsars, and I found on, on the paper of the XTP these four objects. And uh, there is something very interesting here, because uh, the first three objects have rather large masses, especially the first two, and as you recall, in, in this two family scenario, large masses means large radii. They are strange for stars in this scheme. But what about this first object? This first object has a mass of 1.2 plus or minus 0.14. So this object would be really a first family, a neutron star. And it's well possible that this object can have a rather small radius of the order of 11 kilometers. So for us, this would be a fantastic uh, flag. I mean, if uh, EXTP is able to measure at the same time the radii of this object and in particular of this last object, in case it measures a small radius, then we can be very happy because uh, it is clear that there is no alternative scenario in explaining uh, a radius of the order of 11 kilometers or smaller and at the same time for this object having a small mass and at the same time, having larger DI for more massive objects. So thanks a lot for, for this possibility of presenting our work. OK, thank you. Very nice talk. So questions? Uh, Sandra, I have a question. This is Anna. Oh, yeah. um, for, for, the, for the sources that you're listing here with, with the masses, um, particularly for the, for the numbers 2, 3, and 4, um, is there already a move to try and improve those mass measurements? Aha, uh -huh. okay. okay. I mean, I, I don't have you have you already talked this over with some of the radio pulsar people because we've managed no, to get no, we've managed no. to get them to improve mass measurement estimates for NICER. Aha, uh -huh. okay, that is good. If you can send me some info, uh, it would be extremely interesting because what we can do is uh, to provide predictions uh, uh, for the objects which are massive. I mean, at this point, if you look at uh, this uh, Bayesian analysis. Uh, it starts getting rather, uh, uh, I mean, constraining, so to say, yeah. you know? Uh, so it could be interesting at this point to put the numbers. Uh, so if the masses are better determined, uh, uh, we can try to play this game. And, I think it's uh, just it's good to give them some warning time because it, take, it takes a little while to do this. But mm -hmm. if, you, if you were able to give them a science case now, 
yeah, 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 yeah. Through these measurements. I think, I mean, that it's been really helpful for NICER to be able to have tighter measurements. Yeah, so, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and we've got, we've got time in principle for so you. If, if you, if you can send me the, the, the papers that, uh, where there are these tighter masses, it uh, would help a lot. Sure, I, I'll get in touch with you. Thanks, thanks, Anna, thanks. Hey, this is Alessandra with a question for Alessandra. Yeah. yeah. So as far as I understood, then um, let's say for the sources that has been already identified, for example, in the mob observing plan that for sure could be, I mean, updated or modified from now to the latest results. What I would like to, um, uh, to know is if the, the, the um, constraints we plan to have on, ma uh, on radiant mass on the source of the order of two, from five to 10% is enough then to distinguish in the case of the sources yeah. with the lower radii, your, yeah, yeah. your model. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, is, is yeah, this yeah, the accuracy yeah. enough for Absolutely. your Absolutely, look, look, or... look here, look here, look here. For instance, I mean, uh, uh, in the normal case, you, know, you have these three, equations of state that are also appearing here, okay? So let's take uh, an object having a mass of about 1.2. So in the normal one family scenario, you expect a radius of 12 kilometers or more, okay? For an object like that. But here we expect a, a, a radius which can be of the order of 11 kilometers or even less. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, we, we have built, so to say, this branch here based uh, on uh, the relatively old analysis no, of more radii, but uh, uh, it, it is almost impossible to, to be extremely precise because the moment in which you increase density at three, four, five times zero, zero the number of resonances that can appear explodes. So <laughs> you can have radii even smaller. So 11 kilometers is, uh, uh, so to say conservative estimate. So you see there is a more than one kilometer difference. So your 5% is fine, absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much, Alexandro. Thank you, thank you. Thank yeah, you. so I want to thank all the five speakers uh, and I want to invite Mark Ferrosi to chair the next uh, talks. So Marco, please. Yes, thank you, Fanjun. So I take over the chairmanship for, from this point now uh, onward. Uh, so wa, I see you are already set up. So we are running uh, 15 minutes late. So let's try to keep the schedule. All right, so thank Marco and Fanjun for organizing the session. So today on behalf of the strong magnetism working group of the EXTP consortium, uh, I'm trying to talk about uh, what kind of science uh, one can do uh, for objects with extremely strong magnetic fields using X-ray parametry. So actually most of the slides in this talk are uh, made by Silvia, uh, Victor, Andrea, and uh, other members in the working group. Um, according to the current design, one of the payload uh, of the XTP is called the perimetry focusing array. Uh, there are four telescopes on the focal plane. There will be uh, mounted a, a high sensitivity X-ray perimeter, which is a, a gas detector that allow us to measure the track of the photoelectrons and from which we can infer the position uh, fraction and the position angle of the incident X-ray beam. So compared with the uh, X-ray perimeter, the NASA mission EXP, uh, the PFA has a, a effective area at 3 keV, four to five times larger than that of X XP. So that will allow us to measure X-ray position in a smaller energy beam or time beam or phase beam. This is very important because we know that, we expect that the X-ray position uh, is a function of energy time of phase. And it's also important to, to emphasize that uh, we have aligned the payloads for large area, also for large area spectroscopy and the timing. And uh, this is also important as has been mentioned by previous 
speakers. Okay, so the first question is uh, why we can constrain the physics uh, in strong magnetic fields. Uh, I think that's mainly uh, rely on two uh, physical principles. Uh, the first is that uh, with the presence of strong magnetic field, uh, the plasma is uh, polarized. And here I choose the scattering cross-section of uh, plasma uh, uh, on the strong magnetic field. And here are the uh, cyclotron resonance features. And what the energy ranges that we are interested in are actually in the low energy band for EXTP. It's like for two keV to eight keV. As you can see, the O mode uh, uh, scattering uh, cross-section uh, is much higher than that for X mode. Uh, that can be uh, basically be understood as the electrons are well confined in the magnetic field and cannot move freely in the direction perpendicular to the magnetic field. So when an X mode photon tries to scatter with the electron or tries to accelerate the electron along this direction, uh, it's not easy. So as a consequence, uh, the cross section will be highly suppressed. So that means highly magnetized plasma actually X-ray polarizer. Uh, so we will expect to see almost 100% uh, polarized X-rays all in the X mode. And the other one is called the vacuum by refrigerants. This is a QED uh, prediction. And when the magnetic field is extremely strong, uh, even the vacuum can be polarized. So when the X-rays travel in the vacuum, it can fuse the uh, virtual electron and the positron, uh, which are polarized by the external magnetic fields. So when the magnetic field strength is below the critical strength, there is a weak field approximation, which is called a vacuum by refrigerance. So in that case, uh, the dielectric tensor is no longer a uh, unit tensor, so um, the, the, the result would be the X-ray, the position of the X-ray will always follow the orientation of the magnetic field when it propagates in the vacuum. Here is an example. Surface of the neutron star is 100% polarized in each local region. But uh, due to the different orientations of the magnetic field and the position in this direction will cancel out the position in this direction. So end up, we would expect a relatively low position around 20%. But when those X-rays travels in the vacuum and reach a larger distance where the dipole component dominates and the dipole component, component is always uniform and ordered at such a large distance. So we would expect a highly ordered magnetic field and a high degree of polarization up to 100%. Okay, now I will show you several science cases uh, when we apply these physical principles into astroph astrophysical objects. The first problem is a classical problem. So when the strong magnetic field uh, truncates the accretion disk and uh, the accretion materials will go through the uh, magnetic fields and uh, along a column right, and reach the surface of the neutron star. Um, if the optical depth is lower in this direction, then most X-ray will coming out uh, along this direction. This is called the fan beam and otherwise it's called the uh, pencil beam. So as I have mentioned that in this case, the plasma is polarized. So we would expect high degree of polarization at the peak of the, uh, of the X-ray flux. So the peak of the X-ray flux uh, is coincident with the peak of the degree of polarization. Otherwise in the pencil beam, the peak of the flux correspond to the minimum of the degree of polarization. And as you can see for this bright X-ray pulsar, we have a relatively short exposure with the XCP. We can constrain the, the, uh, the model. And this is important because the beam pattern may change as a function of the accretion rate. So we can do the same experiments in different sources at different times. And then this is another example how to constrain the model parameters. Uh, for luminous pulsars, uh, Becker and Wolf, they propose a model uh, that can successfully uh, explain phase-resolved X-ray spectrum. 
And in that model, the materials coming from the top of the column are nearly free fall around this region and it's a supersonic. And then the materials will be deaccelerated by the emission from the bottom of the column and become subsonic. And the optical depth is lower along this direction, so it's emitted in the fan beam. So the Kazo and uh, Hyo, they propose uh, they calculate the polarization signature uh, in the framework of this model. And uh, this is a good example how we can combine spectroscopy timing and the polarization. Because first, you need uh, to fold the light curve and find the phase. And in order to do that, one need a high signal to noise X-ray light curve. With the X-ray polarimeter alone, maybe it's hard, difficult uh, to finish this job. And then we need the X-ray spectrum at different phases so that we can constrain something like the, the, the radius or the size of the column, the temperature uh, and from spectral feeding. And then use, using X-ray polarimetry, we can constrain the geometry. And as you can see, at different energies and uh, the, uh, the, the, the signature of polarimetry is sensitive to the geometry. And this is another example uh, that we have already known that uh, the cyclotron resonance feature, their energy uh, is, uh, will vary as a function of the accretion rate or the luminosity. And this can be explained by a model proposed by Propaning et al. 2013. And they propose that uh, those features are actually produced on the surface of the neutral star by reflection from the column onto the surface. So when the accretion rate is low, so the column is short, only irradiate a small fraction of on the top of the neutron star, but the average magnetic field strength is higher. But at a high, uh, high accretion rate, the column is high and almost the whole hemisphere will be irrad irradiated. So the average magnetic field is lower. So that causes the variation of the cyclotron feature. Those models can also be tested with uh, independently with uh, X-ray polarization because different regions on the surface of the neutron star uh, would produce different uh, signatures of uh, X-ray polarization. Another kind of uh, interesting targets for X-ray polarimetry study is uh, magnetars. Uh, they were identified as uh, soft gamma ray repeaters or anomalous X-ray pulses. They are isolated neutron stars with persistent emission and also exhibit uh, intense and strong bursts, very luminous giant flares and uh, long duration outbursts. Um, they occupy uh, in this diagram, the PP dot diagram in this region, and they are believed to uh, have extremely strong magnetic field at 10 to 14 or even 10 to 15 Gauss, Gauss because they are uh, EM emission, the power of the EM uh, emission is uh, uh, higher than uh, that can be powered by rotational energy loss. So the first question, okay, so in recent years, they become very hot topics because the discovery, the identification of uh, uh, one FRB event from a magnetar. So the, the first question is, what is the emission mechanism of the X-rays, the non-thermal X-rays from magnetar? Um, one popular uh, model or the leading model is uh, because the uh, resonance scattering cross-section is high. So those X-rays are due to uh, the thermal X-ray from the surface of the neutron star being upscattered or inverse Compton scattered uh, in the magnetosphere uh, by the charges in the current. Otherwise, uh, there are also models saying that uh, they could be accreting neutron stars. So here's a, a comparison, the prediction of the two models by the RCS model or the accretion model. As you can see, they predict different signatures in X-ray polarization and can be readily distinguished by EXTP. It's also very important to, to understand or to know the uh, geometry of pulsars. There are two important angles. One is the angle between the viewing angle and the rotation axis of the neutron star. And the other one is the angle between the uh, magnetic axis and the rotation angle. 
And here are simulations. They fix the viewing angle to be 90 degree, but varies the magnetic angle from five degree all the way to almost 90 degree. And as you can see, different geometry would produce a different degree of uh, polarization and a different uh, polarization angles. And uh, this uh, uh, modeling is actually not much dependent on the physical model because it's a pure geometry. And uh, this can allow us to measure the, 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 uh, the, 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 the geometry, the, the magnetic field of the, of the uh, pulsars. Another interesting question about uh, uh, neutron stars uh, is about the surface emission. So in the um, classical model, uh, we always assume that there is a, a gas atmosphere on top of the neutron star. And uh, these gas uh, are actually hot gases, they are plasmas and uh, magnetized plasmas. But uh, uh, it also, there is possibility that because of the presence of a strong magnetic field and the the atmosphere could be condensed. And this depends on the chemical, co chemical composition uh, and the temperature. Uh, here the, in this diagram, and as you can see, some pulsars and some magnetars, they could be, uh, they could have a, a condensed surface uh, if they uh, fall into this region, depending on different uh, chemical uh, compositions. Okay, so what's the difference in their polarization signature. Uh, if it's an atmosphere, then it will produce black body emission. And because the X mode photosphere is deeper because of the lower cross section and it's hotter. So that's, that's why the local black body emission will be nearly 100% polarized. If it's a condensed surface, the reflectivity will be higher. And as a consequence, the emissivity will be lower. So it's not a pure black body. So that's why we would expect a relatively lower degree of polarization. So here's uh, some simulation. As we can see, the atmosphere model always produce high degree of polarization, but the condensed surface is relatively low. So we can distinguish the two models with X-ray polarimetry. In the simulations that I have mentioned uh, uh, earlier, uh, they have all taken into account uh, the QED effect, the vacuum by revergence. Here, I just want to emphasize that without con considering the QED effect, we would expect a polarization degree around 20% or even lower uh, for the thermal emission on the surface of the neutron, uh, neutron star or the magnetars. But once we have the QED effect, we would expect nearly 100% degree of polarization or at least 60%. So once we detect such a high degree of polarization, we can test this QED effect. This is the last piece of prediction by the QED theory and has not been tested in our laboratory. So this will be a very important experiment with X-ray polarimetry. Okay, as uh, this has been mentioned earlier, and in recent years, there have been quite a lot of progresses uh, on modeling the, uh, the thermal emission on the surface of a neutron star to trying to constrain the mass and the radius of the uh, compact object and uh, eventually constrain the equation of state. Uh, mainly, the, those works is by modeling the light curves at different energy bands. So now we realize that uh, the pulsars are more complicated, the magnetic fields are more complicated than we thought. Uh, it's not a simple dipole, not a simple lighthouse. And sometimes the modeling of those light curves, they have some degeneracy and the model is not unique. So at this time, we can use X-ray polarimetry to offer some independent constraints of the geometry. And uh, I believe we can do that, do a better job with uh, X-ray timing alone. Okay, so if you are inter interested in the details of those uh, physics and simulations, and you can find this white paper about uh, uh, how we can do uh, physics with uh, EXTP for, strong, uh, for, for, uh, for objects with strong magnetic fields. I will stop here, thank you.
Thank you very much, Juan, uh, perfectly on time. So the paper is open for question. I see, uh, is there a question from uh, Aditya Tamar? Uh, no, that was a clap, not a question, I'm sorry. <laughs> So wow, I have a curiosity myself. Um, you, you didn't mention uh, the uh, the IXP observations that will take place in the next years. And um, what, which is, the, which kind of science cases uh, cannot be addressed by XP at all with respect to EXCP? Okay, so I think we can do better jobs in uh, two aspects. Um, first, we will have we will observe more sources uh, uh, than XP will do, uh, and as we all know that uh, for each population of uh, astrophysics, uh, the population is always di di has a diversity. Uh, and the second, uh, we have uh, co-aligned instruments uh, for. X-ray uh, spectroscopy timing and the polarimetry, as I have mentioned, for example, for pulsars with uh, X-ray polarimeter alone, sometimes it's even difficult to find the, the light curve and find the faces. So, and also we need a face resolved energy spectrum and to constrain the physics. Uh, so I believe uh, uh, EXTP can do a lot of work that EXP cannot do. Okay, thank you. So I don't see other questions on the floor. So thanks again, uh, Wa, and uh, we move on uh, to Vladimir Karash, orbiting blobs in accretion disk in the era of high angular resolution and polarimetry. Okay, hello. Hello, Vladimir, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the time. I would like to uh, describe work which has been done uh, or started before in a different context in collaboration with Andreas Eckhart in Cologne and Michal Zajacek in Warsaw. But I think it's uh, very relevant also for uh, observing uh, especially bright uh, X-ray uh, flares from uh, supermassive black holes and in this context also for EXTP. Uh, let me, sorry. Uh, let me start with a brief introduction, but I, I will take advantage of uh, the introductions, especially from Alessandra and Anna, uh, so I can try to catch up with time a bit. Uh, more uh, generally, uh, regarding the orbital motion near supermassive black holes and detection of uh, features like blobs and inhomogeneities orbiting with uh, sort of Keplerian velocity. That is a long history uh, in that. Uh, here I am showing uh, 1998 uh, paper which has been uh, based on optical observations. Uh, and you see that already at that time, uh, the supermassive black hole mass could be estimated to uh, the large value in, in that galaxy. Uh, similarly, uh, in uh, also late 90s, uh, Ferrarese uh, et al. Uh, measured uh, H alpha profiles uh, of rotation uh, near supermassive black holes in NGC 4261. Uh, and they uh, saw that uh, it follows uh, approximately Keplerian uh, rotation uh, and uh, inhomogeneities in the uh, accretion, of course, are not revealed uh, in the images, but uh, can be inferred uh, from, the, uh, from this dependence uh, on, uh, on the uh, distance from the black hole. Much more precisely, uh, that is uh, measured uh, with, uh, the, with these observations in NGC uh, 4258 uh, of major sources where uh, Miyoshi et al. and uh, follow up papers could uh, trace not only uh, the orbital motion and measure precisely the central black hole mass, 
but also uh, to see the departures from, from perfect planar uh, geometry. Uh, then uh, coming closer to the black hole horizon, because the previous uh, graphs uh, concerned much larger distances than the central region. Uh, we uh, have an explosion of works recently connected to the reverberation mapping uh, of uh, broad light region AG in AGN. Uh, so I am showing here the generic sketch, uh, this one taken from uh, Ricci, where the inner flow uh, on the accretion on the black hole shown in red, uh, the inner accretion disk uh, illuminates the fluctuations illuminate the broad line region and that can be uh, revealed by uh, time uh, dependence and energy dependence in the reverberation signal. Uh, and as shown by originally by Peterson on Horn for uh, X-ray binaries, but uh, with similar physics also here, we can uh, estimate the central mass uh, from the uh, time dependence of the reverberation signal. Uh, in, in this sense, uh, an interesting uh, idea was proposed by a number of people later, but uh, this this plot is from Anaf Afanasev and Popovich, uh, who realized that uh, the scattering of the uh, central photons on the on the torus on or on broadline region clouds uh, must uh, produce a significant degree of polarization because it is. Uh, it can be scattering at the uh, 90 degree, more or less 90 degree angle uh, in some kind of Thompson uh, approximation. Uh, so that would be certainly uh, very fruitful to have both this uh, timing information uh, for reverberation uh, together with uh, polarization uh, signal. Uh, so we have developed uh, this uh, kind of uh, model uh, with uh, Michal Dovchak and then later Carson in Cologne. Uh, and we moved closer to the central black hole uh, to, uh, to probe uh, the X-ray domain. Uh, on the top left sketch, you see uh, the idea of the model. So the black hole, the orbiting uh, blobs or spots, which are uh, circling around the black hole. Uh, the distance is one of the parameters of that model. And the uh, signal uh, is seen by the detector or by the observer. Uh, at certain inclination above the equatorial plane. And then uh, the modulation of the light curve and also of energy dependence uh, exhibits uh, two peaks. One is uh, due to lensing uh, designated with L here and the other one uh, shifted uh, in phase is the Doppler lensing uh, which uh, occurs when the blob approaches the observer, obviously. Uh, the simple formula uh, down uh, gives the expected time scale as a function of uh, radius of those blobs and uh, mass of the black hole here scaled with 10 to 7 solar masses. Uh, so you can see what time of uh, variability we can expect in the uh, in the second units of seconds here, and you also see that there is a very tiny but still present dependence on a, which is a spin of the central black hole. Uh, so for this kind of setup, we have produced uh, templates of expected light curves. Uh, as a function of uh, all kinds of parameters in the model. Uh, in particular, here you can see two uh, 
uh, cases uh, of moderate uh, spin of the black hole, A equal 0 0.1 in both. Uh, uh, on the left uh, side, uh, the uh, distance of the blob is uh, order of 12 uh, gravitational radii. On the right, it is uh, much closer. Uh, you can notice that when it is closer, then uh, the caustic due to lensing starts to dominate uh, around the phase 0.5 here. Uh, otherwise, uh, at uh, greater distances, it is mainly dominated by Doppler peak, uh, which is here again shifted to the phase uh, of 0.5. Uh, and different curves in each panel correspond to different <clears throat> blob size uh, and different distance from the black hole. So here, uh, the two examples are uh, placed on the data from uh, XMM-Newton measurement of two uh, bright flares. Uh, so in this sense, we anticipate or we assume that the flares are somehow connected with features orbiting the black hole. And in that case, uh, we can uh, fit the uh, flares uh, with our model. Uh, but of course, there are significant uncertainties because the error bars are, uh, are still large. Uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> uh, what we tried to do is to take uh, several uh, brightest flares uh, from the galactic center uh, measured in X-rays uh, with XMM. Uh, so these are references to individual papers uh, from Vaganov, Porke, uh, and uh, Novak et al. Uh, we also averaged these measurements to uh, get uh, median values, and we then we actually uh, edit also Mosu, uh, big flare measured from the same source and uh, assuming the uh, inclination and the varying distance of the flares, uh, we somehow could uh, eventually fit to the black hole mass. And uh, that is uh, what comes out of uh, our all flare uh, fit uh, is order of four times 10 to six solar masses. So, uh, we see that we are in a uh, order of magnitude uh, value consistent with what, what is expected for the Sagittarius A star mass. So our point here is that uh, this method uh, can uh, give an independent uh, way to constrain the supermassive black hole mass. Uh, <clears throat> but then in addition, uh, more, uh, some freedom uh, could be removed if we can get also polarimetric information. So this uh, plot from uh, Munawar uh, thesis uh, in Cologne uh, shows the, the theoretical fits to the expected light curves of these blobs with polarimetric uh, information. Uh, total polarized uh, flux on the left, uh, in this case dominated with the Doppler uh, boosting, single Doppler boosting uh, maximum. But here on the top right and bottom left with the polarimetric uh, information in Q and U, and the degree of polarization is uh, obviously very small, but, but non-zero order of a few percent. So let me uh, conclude saying that uh, assuming that uh, the uh, flares from supermassive black holes are uh, modulated by the orbital motion at the, and that the feature uh, actually survives uh, at least one or, or several orbital periods, uh, we can uh, trace these individual we can uh, see uh, the modulations due to uh, strong gravity, 
So the, it's the combination of uh, light bending and uh, energy shifts due to Doppler and due to gravitational rate shifts. But then in addition, we can also supplement this with the changes of polarization properties. And uh, if, if the signal is uh, truly strong, one could also probe the specific dependence on energy in polarization, but uh, that is probably most likely beyond uh, the reasonable uh, observation time to, to get enough photons for that. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Vladimir. Very nice talk. I see already Alessandra with uh, a question. Alessandra, please yeah. go ahead. Yes, so thanks, Steve. Very interesting talk. No, just uh, I mean, a curiosity due to the fact that uh, you say this method actually is very effective to measure black hole mass. Did you try to make some kind of experiment or, I mean, few? AGN showing the proposed or candidates copy or signal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I should say that we were not in touch, but I expected this question. <laughs> uh, so I have one more slide. We okay. did not do any systematic uh, follow up work on this actually. And I think it should be done. It would be perfect work for. Uh, PhD, I would think, uh, but uh, with uh, Carson, we just looked to this source uh, uh, again with different methods, uh, taking taking the brightest X-ray flares uh, from the literature, uh, which I list here, uh, and uh, in these papers they as estimate again the mass of the supermassive black hole. So we try to estimate the mass with uh, our uh, method, which I described and the hotspot method. And, uh, and as you see, the value is more or less consistent or, or is very well consistent with that. Uh, and uh, maybe just to explain uh, more clearly uh, this question, uh, about the, um, how sensitive the method uh, could be. Uh, so having uh, very bright flares uh, would be obviously uh, advantage for this uh, uh, measurements of the Sagittarius A star. Uh, we eventually ended up with uh, this kind of plots where uh, you see the uh, mass on the horizontal axis uh, and the number of uh, flares uh, treated uh, on the uh, vertical axis and the media, median of, this, uh, of these uh, detections studied with uh, Monte Carlo MCMC modeling is uh, what, what gives this uh, value of uh, four times 10 to the six solar masses. So you see that there is a spread of values from in one single uh, flare, you can get a value which is very much off, uh, but then gaining the statistics, one, one can eventually reach the right value, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay. Thanks, uh, uh, Vladimir. I, I also have a question. From the observation point of view, uh, do you expect to uh, to have triggers for this kind of flares, or do you just uh, observe the, the sources and wait for them? Uh, so, uh, in the, for example, in this galactic center, as you know, there is uh, usually at least one flare per day. Uh, so. Uh, once you are able to monitor the source, it's a very good chance to get uh, some uh, signal. Uh, but for us, it would be good to have uh, to, to improve signal to noise, so, so to have these bright flares. And in the case of the galactic center, out of those uh, all those measurements which go over years, uh, the truly useful are just a uh, 
few, uh, like we used five and since our work uh, lately, there were a few more which could be added, uh, but uh, not many. Okay. So thank you again, uh, Vladimir. So I invite the next speaker to share the presentation. Shen Dong Li, uh, Observatory Science uh, with the XTP. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, good evening. Uh, so uh, the, the title of my talk is Observatory uh, Science with XTP. And I'm Shen Dong Li from Nanjing University. And, and, and this uh, talk uh, is based on the work um, by the Observatory Science Working Group. So, uh, and we know that uh, uh, for the observatory science, uh, the uh, targets uh, for XTB um, are uh, generate variable and transient objects. So, um, um, in this regard, uh, XTB will be a discovery machine. That means uh, uh, it will uh, discover and, and many new and uh, scientific objects and also the process and 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 by. Uh, the discovery uh, we can um, um, shed new lights um, on the fundamental uh, questions, and also uh, it will monitoring um, hundreds of sources uh, daily, and and finally, an um, EXTB will be a very good um, X-ray partner of other multi messenger facilities uh, like uh, say, um, LIGO, Virgo or, or SKA, and and so the the targets of an um, EXTB and um, cover wide range of objects and, and from stars to uh, supermassive black holes in other galaxies. And, and for example, and, uh, for, and, uh, we have a uh, friend stars uh, supernova remnants and uh, accretion um, binaries, uh, including a um, white dwarf and uh, a neutron star and a black hole accretors, and also uh, AGN, GRB, supernovae, and tidal disruption events, and, and uh, the gravitational wave counterparts and finally and, and fast uh, radio bursts. Uh, uh, since um, some of the topics um, have been or will be uh, discuss discussed extensively uh, in this meeting. So I will uh, select uh, several uh, topics um, to, um, to, to show uh, the potential of the uh, EXTB. Uh, so the, the, the first type uh, of the objects is um, uh, a flaring stars. Uh, the stellar flaring uh, activities are caused by uh, magnetic uh, recognition on uh, late type stars, and for example, from our sun, and also from other type stars uh, like uh, uh, young stars, uh, M dwarfs, and, uh, and uh, tidally locked uh, active binary systems. Uh, so, in, in, in the upper figure, show um, an example for the uh, solar uh, post flare loops um, on the surface. And during the uh, flares and, and energetic particles uh, streaming down, uh, producing intense uh, hard X-ray emission and by, and say, um, brimstone and, and Compton scattering at the uh, loop front, uh, loop uh, footprints. So uh, uh, at the same uh, moment, um, uh, there are also radio emission and from the flaring, flaring and due to the synchrotron radiation. Uh, so the, an uh, XTV uh, will detect at least uh, 35 super flares uh, per year uh, for, uh, from stars exhibiting uh, the extremes of, of magnetic activity. And uh, there are several important questions that can be answered by uh, the observation of XTV. For example, uh, uh, what's the flare distribution with energy and how they, they change with time? And, and and the, uh, the, the second one is uh, the temperature and the element, elemental abundances uh, as a function of time during the flares. So uh, from uh, these uh, studies, uh, we, can, um, um, uh, we can obtain the information about uh, the uh, particle acceleration and also the uh, emission um, mechanism. Uh, so um, in the lower figure, uh, there are uh, comparison between the soft X-ray and uh, radio peak luminosity uh, for different uh, types of uh, uh, late type stars. Uh, so it's very interesting that uh, and they show a good correlation between each other. 
And so uh, EXTB can be a part finder for um, radio burst, and which will be, um, say, observed by um, FAST or XSKA. And finally, um, they can also uh, give um, a very uh, useful information on the dependence of the source types. And for example, there are um, suggestions that uh, the fairing uh, can um, originate from the uh, interaction between the uh, state map fields and the accretion disks. So uh, what's the difference between uh, this type of flares and the uh, normal state flares? So that will be, um, uh, can, can be started by uh, XTB observation. Uh, the, the second um, uh, is supernormal remnants and pulse wind neighborhood. A supernormal remnant and, and pulse wind neighborhood, they, uh, they are um, manufacturers of high energy cosmic rays, and especially in, in our galaxy, uh, with the um, particle energy up to uh, 10 to 15 EV, uh, that is PEV. Uh, in the uh, left figure, that shows the uh, spectrum of cosmic ray and and so the evidence for PEV and particles can be a very strong indication of the origin of, of the particle acceleration. And, and, and there is a very uh, great progress in, in recent years by uh, the experiment of ACE gamma and also the observation by, by LASO and, uh, on uh, several um, supernormal remnants and the pulsar wind nebula. And, in the uh, middle and the right figures, and, and we show the spectrum and also the significance map um, around the supernova remnant uh, G116. Uh, so can, you can see that the, 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 the particle energy is up to uh, 100 um, TeV. So that, that is a very uh, clear indication for a um, very high energy uh, cosmic rays. And their the, uh, supernova remnants are also the uh, emitter of diffuse X-ray synchrotron radiation in, in our galaxy. So uh, the EXTB detection of um, the non-thermal X-ray emission of the relativistic electrons uh, arising from the strong shocks of um, the supernova remnants, and they can also do um, fine measurements of the distribution of the magnetic fields. Um, around the, the, the shocks of the uh, supernova remnants and also their um, polarized uh, emission. Uh, by these observations, uh, we can try to answer the, the questions such as uh, how does the orientation of particle injection with, with respect to the magnetic field lines and how uh, this um, orientation affects the uh, acceleration efficiency. So there are, there are two kinds of uh, models. One is uh, so-called the uh, quasi parallel and the other is a quasi perpendicular. So, and um, uh, we uh, and now we we are not sure which one uh, really works at and uh, in the supernova remnants. Uh, the second question is uh, uh, what is the intensity of the synchrotron radiation uh, by the uh, high energy uh, electrons and what is the orientation of the magnetic field in the forward and the reverse shock in supernova remnants and finally the mechanisms of the Application of the map field. Uh, so, um, uh, with this observation, we, we can um, obtain a, a very clear um, picture of the map field uh, uh, orientation and evolution and, uh, around the, 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 the forward and the reverse shocks and in supernormal remnants. Uh, thirdly, uh, uh, accreting white dwarf binaries. Uh, they are many. Uh, uh, CVs uh, with uh, variability and uh, with a time scale um, uh, from seconds to years. Uh, we know that, that there are uh, many um, transient or outburst uh, uh, behavior in, in CVs. Uh, for example, the uh, disk instability and the um, accretion in, uh, and injection, and also Norway. And, and most importantly, uh, accreting white dwarfs could be the potential progenitors of type 1a supernovae. And they are also uh, the possible origin of the galactic rich X-ray emission. Uh, so they play a very important role in, in the um, X-ray emission in our, in our galaxy. 
And by uh, monitoring the fast um, X-ray availability, so we can uh, try to study how does the matter accrete onto the white dwarfs. Uh, for example, um, we can uh, detect the uh, both uh, periodic and aperiodic oscillations. Uh, for example, the, the pulse uh, uh, pulse emission and also the um, uh, QPU uh, from uh, the um, CVs and to study the uh, mass accretion processes uh, onto white dwarfs. And we can also uh, monitoring uh, our wide energy range of the extra spectrum of CVs. And to, to study during the, uh, the, the novel eruptions, how matter is um, ejected. And finally, uh, there is a very important uh, question um, is uh, the white dwarf mass distribution in CVs. Uh, it is uh, very interesting to know that uh, in CVs, the, the average uh, mass of white dwarfs are uh, heavier than the mass of single white dwarfs. So uh, the reason is not, um, it, 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 it's still open, and, but we can um, have more um, samples to confirm uh, uh, this uh, tendency. For example, um, uh, on the right figures, it shows the uh, flux ratio of uh, 7.0 uh, kV and flux uh, over uh, 6 .5, 6 .7, uh, flux. And it's a, uh, uh, there is a very a good um, correlation between this flux ratio and the um, radiation temperature, and in uh, the, say the boundary layer of the of the accreting white dwarfs. And from this flux ratio, we can try to estimate the mass of the white dwarfs. And in the lower figure, it shows that uh, they also have a, a very good uh, correlation. Uh, so that means that uh, from X-ray observation, we can try to and obtain the mass distribution of white dwarfs. And uh, the, uh, the, the first type of uh, the objects are extra binaries and also um, uh, in, in, including uh, both a uh, neutron star and black hole extra binaries and also their um, final um, objects, uh, say double neutron stars and double um, black holes and also uh, black hole neutral star uh, binaries. And this uh, question becomes um, very important in the uh, gravitational uh, wave era. As although we, um, from the standard uh, picture, we, we know the formation and evolution of uh, massive star uh, binaries and how they produce a, a double compact uh, stars. And however, there are some uh, very important questions and, and raised uh, Due, uh, due to the gravitational wave radiation, for example, the, uh, the, the so-called mass gaps. And there are two mass gaps. One is uh, the two to five solar mass uh, mass gaps for, for uh, state mass black holes. And uh, also uh, there, there is another up um, um, mass gap that is um, um, from um, say 80 to, to 100, 100 uh, uh, solar masses uh, mass gap uh, due to the uh, pair and instability in, in massive stars. So uh, are these uh, mass gaps real? Or if they are real, so how to explain and how to um, um, try to, 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 to um, theoretically uh, understand these mass gaps? There will be, uh, they, uh, these are very important for the uh, stellar evolution theory. And for the formation and evolution of complex stars, we can uh, also have some other very important questions to answer, and, and like uh, the ultra compact binaries, uh, they are they could be the potential sources for for an um, uh, LISA and uh, uh, transitional uh, millisecond pulses, uh, which uh, show the transition between um, radio and X ray activity and um, uh, due to the um, accretion and non accretion onto the um, Onto the, onto the magnetizing neutron stars. And also uh, uh, the uh, population uh, characteristics are very fan X-ray binaries. And so we, we know uh, uh, ab about uh, several tens of them, but um, what's the evolutionary link between these uh, very fan X-ray binaries and the normal X-ray binaries uh, is still unknown. Uh, so by uh, enlarging that sample, uh, we can uh, obtain an, uh, a complete picture for their 
erosion and formation history. Uh, the uh, fifth type uh, uh, of just are the uh, extra burst uh, on accreted neutron stars. Actually, there are, uh, uh, most of them are uh, type one or the thermonuclear extra burst. So, so uh, EXP uh, expect uh, it is correct to detect an then about a uh, ten thousand X ray bursts uh, in uh, three years observation. So this number is of the same order of the magnitude as all the bursts detected uh, during the X ray history. And so from these uh, extensive uh, observations, we can actually have uh, a lot of um, uh, say um, insights uh, for the uh, fundamental uh, questions uh, related to. To the uh, thermonuclear X-ray burst, uh, for example, uh, what's the nature of the burst oscillation? Uh, so by timing observations, uh, we we can follow the the, the whole history of an uh, of an burst and from the beginning of the burst to the uh, decay phase to the end of the phase, uh, end of the burst. So we, we can obtain the, the the how the evolution of the burst oscillation and is there a preferred ignition latitude on the uh, on uh, rapidly rotating neutron stars. Uh, so on, on different uh, uh, ignition latitude, the, 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 uh, the burst file show different uh, uh, features. Uh, this can be seen uh, from the upper uh, figure, uh, uh, which is simulated by, um, by uh, Stromia and his uh, co-works. And, and from different uh, latitude, uh, you can see that the profile is, is quite different. Uh, so that, that can give you information about the, the location of the burst. And what characterizes the transition from stable to unstable nuclear burning? Uh, so th this can be uh, studied by uh, the observation of the superburst, especially uh, during the aftermath of the superburst. And uh, during this phase, uh, the, um, the, the burning uh, transitioned from stable uh, to unstable. So th this will provide very, uh, very important information. Uh, the, the sixth uh, topic uh, uh, is on uh, high mass excited binaries. Uh, we know that uh, high mass binaries uh, consist of two types of uh, binaries, uh, uh, that is a uh, supergiant uh, X-ray binaries and uh, B X-ray binaries. Uh, so the, the, the donor stars are um, uh, uh, supergiants or uh, B, B stars. Uh, there are many uh, uh, studies on, on, on this uh, types uh, X-ray binaries. However, um, some new um, types of X-ray binaries, especially so-called super-fast uh, X-ray transients, uh, discovered by uh, Indigo, uh, has raised uh, the question: that is, uh, what's the difference between the super-fast X-ray transient and the supergiant, uh, the classical supergiant high-mass binaries? Uh, it seems that uh, they um, they show the very similar feature. Um, for their, um, say, of the peers uh, and the, the, the donor uh, type. So uh, the, the difference may uh, lie in the uh, wind structure, for example, the, 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 the clumped uh, wind uh, in uh, superfast extraction, or due to, say, the uh, magnetic, uh, gate mechanism um, in the superfast extraction. Uh, but we, we still uh, need more informa information uh, on um, the um, uh, how the uh, super uh, superfast uh, super transient uh, show the, the, the burst and the, the, the quiescent uh, intervals. And the, the second question is uh, what causes the top reversal? And the third one is uh, what does the, the distribution of the spin periods and the B fields of, of accreting neutron stars? And finally, what causes the accreted and the propeller state transition? So I, I will. Uh, say something about the second and the third uh, question. Uh, sorry, Shandon, you have one minute uh, left. Okay, okay, I, I, I will finish the last page. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the left figure shows the uh, erosion of the neutron star synchrotron, uh, synchrotron uh, line energy uh, with absorbed X-ray luminosity. Uh, so from this figure, we can, first we, 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 we can uh, obtain information about the, the, the uh, B field distribution. And we also get very important information about how the cyclotron line energy evolves with the luminosity. 
So this uh, will be closer related to the accretion column uh, erosion. Uh, so the, the picture is quite complicated it shows uh, by, by the, the figure. Yeah. And the right figure shows a, a, a spin history uh, for uh, the extra pulsar MC X, X4 uh, during its uh, more than um, um, 43 years of observations. And it shows uh, the top reversal by, let's uh, say, spin up and spin down, and then spin up, spin down. So what's the reason for this top reversal? Uh, it's, it's still uh, open to, um, to, to, the, to, uh, to the theoretical um, mod mod modeling. And so um, by XTP observation, one with and, uh, uh, the, the spectral and the timing of X-ray pulsars, we can get um, uh, much more information about these features. Uh, so I, I stop here. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is there any question for uh, Shandong? So I have, I have one curiosity. I've seen that you have mm, reported a prediction of 10,000 uh, X-ray bursts, the type one X-ray bursts, I guess, in three years. That is a, a very large number. And yes. Uh, yes, they will be concentrated in uh, uh, during the observation of the galactic center or galactic uh, plane. Uh, so that means that we have se several tens of uh, burst uh, every day for uh, during those observations. So I was wondering whether the there would be need for some follow up observation with the narrow field instruments. I guess these are all with the WFM. And uh, do we do we will we need to follow up any of these sources with the narrow field instruments, or we just observe the, the X-ray bars with the working model? Yeah, I, I think it's, this is a, a and that's a rough estimation of, of the potential of the XTB. And, and obviously, we, we can focus on uh, the, the important targets, especially for the uh, say for for, for super bursts. I, I think that it will get. Uh, much more information about the, uh, the, the uh, how the the, the, the burst e e evolves and how the, uh, the nuclear burning and transition uh, tra transit from from a stable burning to, to unstable burning. Uh, so so that, that does not mean we we will cover all the uh, bur uh, extra bursts. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. We move on to the last uh, talk of this session. And uh, Julia Strata, please share the screen. And the talk is about the role of EXTP in the multi-messenger astronomy era. Yes, uh, okay. So if... Uh... Uh, Shandong, you should stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Okay, so um, so in this talk we will see the the, um, the role that will play uh, XCP during the the end of the twenties in the context of multi messenger uh, astronomy, and uh, the, this talk is divided in uh, mainly in two parts. Where in the first part I will uh, give you a brief overview of all the detectors and their uh, uh, the upgrades that are planned for the the end of the twenties uh, detectors of neutrinos and gravitational waves. And in the second part, we will see some um, uh, the, the electromagnetic counterparts that XTP uh, will detect with some uh, uh, focus on uh, the, the case of 17 or 817 and, uh, and uh, core collapsing supernovae. So before starting, just, just let me uh, remind you how important is the multi-messenger uh, uh, observations. Uh, we see here two uh, breakthrough discoveries that I, I, I would like to recall. One is the coincidence of an neutrino event discovered on 2017 with a flaring blazer. And the, um, the possibility to identify the source of neutrinos, it has enormous uh, implication in the, um, our understanding which are the source that are accelerating uh, particles in the universe to very high energies. And in the bottom of the slide, you see the famous case of 17 or 17 that are the binary natural star merger who gave rise to the sure gamma burst. And uh, thanks to the electromagnetic counterparts, we were able to 
not only to, uh, to confirm the nature of short gamma bursts, uh, but also the role of uh, binary neutron star systems of neutron stars uh, to, within the production of heavy elements in the universe, uh, their role in measuring the cosmological uh, parameters, as well as our understanding on the uh, production of jets from the systems and, uh, and their collimation. So by the end of the 20s, we expect for what concerns the neutrino detectors that in the northern hemisphere, the um, Antares heritage will be uh, completely given to the kilometer cube uh, net. And uh, also the Baikal uh, gigaton volume detector will be almost completed. And their sensitivity will reach the, uh, will be comparable to the, uh, the current uh, sensitivity of ice cube in the north, southern hemisphere. And uh, in, instead, in the southern hemisphere, we will have the upgrade of ice cube to uh, ice cube generation two, who is expected to uh, be operational in 2033. So the, the overall upgrading uh, neutrino detectors will boost the, the detection rate of cosmic astrophysical uh, uh, neutrinos and therefore enhancing significantly the probability to uh, find the electromagnetic counterpart of these sources. For what concerns the gravitational wave interferometers, uh, XTP will work in, a, in an epoch where all the five uh, uh, interferometers will, be, uh, will, will work uh, together in a, in a network. And in fact, they will reach a sensitivity that is larger than the nominal one for the second generation. We expect, in fact, for the both LIGO and Virgo to, to be upgraded already in the, in the fifth uh, run. And in particular, the LIGO, uh, the LIGO interferometers are expected to, uh, to undergo major upgrades in order to test some key technologies for the, um, the third generations. And this uh, configuration of the LIGO is called Voyager, and this will increase significantly uh, their sensitivity. Uh, here we have a table with the expected distance reach of the different type of gravitational wave uh, sources that will be detected with these second generation interferometers. So we see here the value, uh, these values are in fact taken into account, for example, for the compact binary coalescences, all the possible orientation of the orbital plane and all the possible orientation in the sky. This means that in fact, uh, for optimal orientation, this can be these distances can be boosted by a factor larger than uh, two. And uh, on the right, we have the, uh, some expectation for the detection rate. The best uh, publicly available uh, estimates uh, stops to uh, the fourth run. Uh, and for example, for binary natural star merger, we expect um, a detection rate of the order of 10 uh, per year. And to have a rough uh, estimate of what we will get with the A plus, for example, configuration, or also with the Voyager, we can uh, think to um, uh, multiply this value for a, 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 a few for a plus or 10 of the order of tens per year, and with the Voyager up to a few hundreds per year for what concern uh, Baron and Tussar. And in green, we have the uh, sky localization accuracy of these uh, sources that will be uh, uh, rather uh, silver, rather very uncertain. So uh, of the order of few uh, tens of square degrees. So um, by the half of the 30s, we will have the um, third generation interferometers. So far we have two main projects. One is Cosmic Explorer in the United States and one is the Einstein telescope in, uh, in Europe and they will reach 10 times larger sensitivities and this will boost the detection rate, for example, for binary natural star merger up to 10 to the five um, events per year. Still, the localization accuracy in the sky will be uh, rough for most of them, for the vast majority of them, of the order of few tens up to several hundreds of square degrees. 
depending on uh, how the third generation network will be uh, formed. Here on the right, we have a plot that shows the distances up to which a source of total um, of several uh, uh, total frame, uh, total source frame mass, uh, different values of total mass will be uh, detected. So for example, in neutral neutral merger, we are in the blue stripe so far and uh, with the third generation, we will we'll be able to detect these events up to near the, the peak of the star formation rate. And we see the orange stripe is the Voyager configuration that is uh, uh, in the midway between the current situation and the third generation. So XTP will, uh, will fly in, a, and in an epoch while, uh, where he will uh, will uh, work in a full synergy, for example, with the kilometer cube net uh, neutrino detectors and with the advanced second generation uh, uh, interferometers. And the role of XTP can be uh, summarized in three main steps. One is the uh, independent detection of the electromagnetic counterpart. And this is uh, extremely important in order also to increase the confidence, for example, for low uh, sub-threshold events or low signal to noise uh, ratio events and to um, cover uh, the uh, observations also in the electromagnetic spectrum. And the second uh, important uh, role of XTP is to provide uh, uh, sky coordinates, accurate sky coordinates of these sources uh, and to uh, release them to the community in order to trigger follow-up campaigns and this again will uh, is, is, has enormous importance in order to characterize the sources. And finally, the instrumentation on board of XTP will uh, itself uh, provide uh, a deep and uh, long monitoring again to uh, aim it for the source characterization. So now let's see uh, which are uh, the possible electromagnetic counterparts of this multi messenger uh, target for uh, XTP. Uh, here I have uh, summarized in, um, a very uh, um, a rough uh, table that is providing some example of multi-messenger targets. And uh, of uh, all these classes so far, we have uh, confirmed the multi-messenger nature for uh, the one I have highlighted here. So compact binary uh, merger of uh, natural stars and uh, um, blazers in fact. And uh, in this talk, I will focus uh, on the first two classes of uh, sources for what concern the XTP uh, capabilities. So let's start with the compact binary coalescences. This sketch provides an indication of all the electromagnetic counterparts we expect from uh, uh, the coalescences, for example, of two neutron stars. And soon after the merger, we expect the formation of a torus and, and, and ultimately the formation of a relativistic jet that provides a short gamma burst. And if a neutron star merger is formed, a long-lived neutron star uh, remnant is formed, we expect also additional uh, component that we will see in a moment. And then uh, later on, on much longer time scales, we may expect a uh, high energy emission from the impact of the ejecta, ejected material from uh, uh, the neutral star mergers into the interstellar matter, uh, into the interstellar matter. And uh, the, the impact of this ejecta is producing a shock that may uh, produce uh, late time X-ray emissions. So let's start from recalling what we have observed for the case of 17 or 17 that is far the only uh, the only electromagnetic counterpart of a gravitational wave source. So this was apparently a very uh, standard short gamma ray burst with mm, faint fluence and uh, the standard uh, duration for short gamma ray bursts. However, uh, if we um, consider the fact that this was a very close by event at 40 uh, megaparsec, it is immediately uh, realized that the uh, energetics is extremely low, several order of magnitude below the standard energetics observed in short gamma ray bursts. Uh, on the right, we have the uh, X-ray afterglows observed for this case. And again, this is very uh, peculiar, very different from the standard X-ray afterglows. 
it rises very slowly, it reaches a peak, uh, a peak at about 10 uh, days after the merger, and then uh, and now is, uh, is decaying uh, uh, again very slowly. So the, all the picture, uh, the, phenomenology, the, phenom the phenomenology can be interpreted with a Novaxis uh, view of a sure gamma burst, of a standard sure gamma burst. Um, this can explain the low energetics that has been observed in the prompt emission and the peculiar um, afterglow behavior. There are uh, currently uh, several modeling that are attempting to describe the structure of the jet. And by taking into account this modeling, one can predict the flux, a different viewing angle, and therefore estimates the distances up to which we can detect a similar object at, um, for example, with XTP. And this work has been done, for example, for Tesius. Uh, and we see here on the right uh, a panel that shows the uh, distances up to which we can detect an, an event like 17 with 17, a different viewing angle. And the main results I would like to highlight here is that if we go uh, soft, see, if we take the soft part band of the, the detectors, we can go up to very large uh, viewing angle. And this has interesting implication in terms of uh, detection rates of uh, uh, joint detection rate. Um, XCP is a, a particular suitable, so survey um, detector sensitive to the soft uh, part of the uh, X-ray range are particularly uh, suitable to observe extended emission of short gamma bursts. So why this is particularly interesting? Because, um, so first of all, extended emission has been observed in a fraction of short gamma bursts. This is a, a, an emission that lasts for a tens of uh, up to hundreds of seconds and have a soft, softer spectrum with respect to the main peak. We still do not know the origin of this extended emission. However, uh, one possibility is that it is produced by a newly born magnetar. And in this case, the, we expect a much less collimation with respect to the, the main event. So this is why it's particularly interesting to observe this feature in terms also the, of uh, joint detection rate with uh, gravitational waves uh, sources. So for these reasons, uh, I have attempted to uh, simulate the uh, uh, capabilities of XTP to observe this type of short gamma burst and uh, additional component. And to this aim, I have taken um, a sample of uh, short gamma burst with this extended emission for which the spectral parameter were uh, fairly well uh, constrained by uh, joint observation of Swift and, uh, and Fermi. And uh, these are uh, some preliminary results in terms of detection significance. This is the sample of short gamma bursts I have analyzed, and these are the redshift of available for a, a subsample of them. And we see in blue the uh, significance uh, of in the detection of the main spike, and in orange, the significance in detection of the extended emission. So not only XCP will be able to detect this component, but also in uh, most of the cases with a larger uh, significance with respect of the main peak. So for what concerns the uh, possibility to uh, follow up the X-ray afterwards, uh, <clears throat> in the local universe, that is the one spanned by the second generation interferometers, it is very likely that we will observe off axis afterwards. And we have already seen that this, uh, the afterwards with this view in angle has a, a different shape what, with, with respect to those where we are typically observed with Swift XRT. In particular, it shows a rise and a very late time peak and then a decay. This is the case of 17 or 17. And uh, with XTP SFA, we will be able to uh, monitoring uh, very accurately the shape of these uh, uh, light curves. And, and this is very important because the shape is encoding uh, very important information on the uh, structure of the jet and, for example, on the profile of the edge of the, of the jet. 
and therefore on the energy distribution, angular distribution uh, within the jet. And even more exciting, you see here uh, that nowadays for uh, this event, uh, Chandra is providing some uh, um, deviation with respect of the expectation of the uh, standard of, aft of axis afterglows. And this deviation, um, uh, the, the interpretation is still uncertain, but one possibility is that they are produced by the impact of the kilonova with the interstellar matter. And um, uh, the flux level that uh, has been reached can be uh, nicely uh, observed with XCP, and therefore uh, uh, this is a, um, a, a, an issue that uh, with the XCP we will uh, be able be able to uh, monitor and investigate with great accuracy. So, for what concern uh, core collapse supernovae, the gravitational wave signal is uh, different with respect to the compact binary coalescence. Uh, and also the uh, output in gravitational waves is much more uh, uncertain. And this in turn makes their uh, uh, detectability, the, the range up to which we will be able to detect this uh, predicted emission uh, very uncertain. Um, for what, and this is why the, the electromagnetic counterpart is extremely important in order to uh, confirm any possible uh, detection of such uh, gravitational wave event. So one uh, interesting counterpart are, is uh, uh, represented by the supernova shock breakout. Why? Because this is very close uh, by in, um, in time to the, uh, to the gravitational wave signal. Uh, and uh, uh, so far, we have uh, one confirmed uh, um, case of supernova shock breakout that has been observed serendipit serendipitously with the X-ray telescope on board of SWIFT. And the uh, uh, simulation preliminary uh, result from simulation with XTP while field monitors showing that this cannot be uh, in fact detected. And in the sense, perhaps more promising uh, um, targets uh, that will uh, give the electromagnetic counterpart of these uh, gravitational wave signals are represented by the class of subluminous uh, long gamma ray bursts that are, uh, uh, in fact, uh, localized in, in very close by in the nearby universe. And for this type of sources, XTP uh, Wi-Fi monitor will provide uh, uh, a large a detection with large uh, significance. So these are uh, more promising with respect to the shock uh, breakout event. So and jump to, uh, to to the conclusion, um, the XTP launch date is, is perfectly um, will perfectly make it. Um, to play a, a very important role in the multi-messenger astronomy, working in synergy with the upgraded second generation uh, detectors, as well as neutrino uh, detectors. Um, multi-messenger, there are many multi-messenger targets in, the, in for XTP, and in particular, uh, we have seen that uh, off-axis short gamma bursts can be detected and characterized. Um, with the XCP instrumentation and uh, the possibility to provide uh, accurate sky localization is extremely uh, important in order to trigger um, follow-up campaigns with other uh, generation uh, with next generation facilities as for example SKA ELT that will uh, uh, be extremely important to further characterize these multi-messenger sources and I will stop here. Thank okay, you. thank you, Julia. It's time for one question. Uh, so if not, I, I have actually a comment uh, and uh, not only for you, Julia, but also for uh, Margarita, Alessandra, and Yuri, for example. That is, I think we should uh, make sure that we have a proper uh, onboard triggering capabilities for the for gamma ray bursts for the different families that we have shown. And uh, so I think it would be important uh, to, to have you in the loop 
of the of the design of the onboard triggering uh, software and and algorithm. Uh, Margarita, do you have any information about how that activity is progressing, or Yuri, that you are also following the uh, software? Regarding your uh, comment, Marco, I fully agree, and congratulations for very nice, very nice and interesting talk, Julia. Thank you. You should, be, you should work in, col in collaboration for the. Uh, yes. uh, if I can say something, not we are still not working on the triggering algorithm uh, from the software point of view, but I also, of course, think it's very important uh, to to join the uh, the work uh, by Julia, and uh, also uh, we are working on another project on triggering algorithm for. Uh, uh something similar so probably we can also use this uh, heritage and uh, and pro i hope also some uh, preliminary testing uh, in flight uh, at the beginning of 2023 so probably we can put the thing together sure i have a i would like to make a, also a comment that um it is very important of course, we, if we can use it, um, XTP Wi-Fi monitor, it's very important because it will provide a, 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 an accurate localization of this event. But also, the um, we may consider and uh, and uh, we should do also some uh, simulation with the LAD because temporal coincidence. Even if we do not have uh, uh, precise the sky localization. The, the possibility to have a simultaneous, nearly simultaneous event is very important for uh, uh, association of, uh, of this multi-messenger source with the electromagnetic counterpart. So uh, mm, I was wondering if there is the possibility to simulate with the loud response uh, files, um, also considering off-axis viewing angle. So uh, considering the... Mm, sources outside the field of view, and the collimator field of view. Yeah, probably this is a question for Alessandra, but I, I think, yes, this is feasible. Yes, sure. Yeah, it should be feasible to do with the lab. It's yeah, okay. important, I agree, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have one last question by, Car by Vladimir. And uh, then I think we need to close because I got a message from the, uh, the organizers that the session will be shut down uh, uh, shortly. So I think we need to speed up. Uh, Vladimir, please go ahead. Now, just a quick question and maybe naive. Is there any consideration uh, in this multi-messenger uh, area to coordinate with uh, Cherenkov telescopes? Anything? Yes, in fact, there is a, uh, for, for, for uh, CTA, for example, there is um, a working group dedicated to, to the detection of uh, these multi messenger sources. So, uh, definitely, it is extremely important to coordinate with, uh, also with them for with CTA, for example. Uh -huh, but is, is there anything uh, kind of written in a white paper or something? Uh, there are some proceedings. Um, I can uh, I can uh, send you some uh, reference about this. That would be nice. Thank you. Okay. So I think uh, it's time to close for the reason I mentioned, and uh, I would like to thank all the speakers uh, and. Uh, I think this was, in case, an interesting session, and the and the recording will allow also people uh, outside or attending parallel sessions at the same time to access this uh, this session as well. So thanks everybody, and uh, looking forward to meet you in person sometime. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you everybody. Can I Bye. Bye.